All right, good morning. It's 9.32 a.m., so we will get our meeting underway, assuming everyone can hear me. Oh, yeah, good, there's some nods. Perfect. So we're here today with Agenda 20 of our Standing Committee on Environmental Protection, Water, and Waste Management for Tuesday, November 16th, 2021. So first, I will ask... Uh, Chris, to do a roll call, please. Happy to do so, Chair. Councillor Brockington. Councillor Cloutier. Present. Councillor DeRuz. Yeah. Councillor Eglai. Here. Councillor Hubley. He's going to be a smidge late. Councillor King. Here. Councillor McKinney. Present. Once again, back to Councillor Brockington, if he's here. Well, I can see he's being admitted right now. He is uh, being promoted to panelist. And Vice Chair Menard. Present. And Chair Moffat, you're here. You Hi, have form, Mr. Chair. All right, thank you so much. Um, just a quick welcome I see to Councillor Kathy Curry, who I see is on, on here today. So nice to have you with us today and welcome to our, our team. Thank you. Perfect. All right, so it's budget day at the Environment Committee. So any decorations of interest? Seeing none. Confirmation minutes for the meeting of Tuesday, October 19th, 2021. Are those items, are those minutes uh, carried? Carried. Carried, thank you. So we'll just run through the list here. So item one is the budget. So we have speakers on that. Item two is local improvement policy review and update on ditch alteration policy, which might sound very mundane to all of you, but I quite love it. So we're gonna have a presentation on that. Number three is strategy for provincial hazardous and special products program transition to individual producer responsibility. Um, so we have two similar files, uh, both. Item three is the hazardous and special products program, whereas item four is the blue box program. Does anyone have any questions on that or can we receive those receive those report that report? Received. 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 And item four, which is update on provincial blue box program, transition individual producer responsibility. Um, this is a little different. It's received the report, received the update on the provincial blue box program transition to individual producer responsibility, and to delegate authority to general manager of public works and environmental services department to begin nego negotiations with producer produce responsibility organizations in preparation for this transition. Any questions on that? Can hold it or can we receive and carry that? Chair, First. both of these items are going to council, so they should both be received and carried. Oh, yeah, okay, well, fair enough. Should probably put that in the thing then. More than just the received on the first one, right? Anyway, so carried on, the, carried on item three and then carried on item four. Carried, carried. received and carried. Carried, received, received, carried. <laughs> Whatever, right, Catherine? Just one of them, just all of them, just all of the things. Oh, I had a, no, that was just a correspondence. We're all good on item four. Item five is the financial statements for in-house solid waste collection, external audit results. I don't have any speakers on that. Um, it's that the Standing Committee on Environmental Protection, Water and Waste Management recommend council receive this report for information. Any comments or questions on that item? Seeing none, see item carried. Carried. Thank you. And item six, status updates. The always exciting status update on standing committee and environmental protection, water waste management, inquiries and motions for the period ending November 4th, 2021. That our committee received this report for information. Is the item received? Received. Received. Thank you so much. So we'll go back to item one, which is the budgets. Of course, we have the excitement of having 
two budgets at this committee, a tax supported budget and a rate supported budget, which we don't all pay for. Some of us do, some of us don't. Like I don't pay for the rate budget, but I also have a well and a septic system. So it kind of makes sense. All right. So I think we have Isabel Jasmine here for that presentation. Take it away, Isabel. Can somebody display the presentation? Are you starting, Marilyn, or? I am, sorry. Okay. You're, we're starting off with Marilyn Journeau. So good morning, everyone. Is this, is mm -hmm. it up? Okay. My name is Marilyn Journeau, and I'm the Acting Director of Water Services. And I'm pleased to be with you this morning to deliver the draft 2022 budget. I'd like to introduce my colleagues who will be presenting with you today. Isabel Jasmine, the Deputy City Treasurer, is here on behalf of Finance. And Karina Duclos, Acting Director of Infrastructure Services, is here on behalf of Planning, Infrastructure, and Economic Development. Next slide, please. The focus of this morning's presentation will be to review the tax and rate supported operating and capital budgets as they pertain to the Standing Committee on Environmental Protection, Water, and Waste Management. I'll now pass it over to Isabel. Thanks, Marilyn. Next slide. So the following four service areas are included in the draft tax supported budget, infrastructure services, resiliency and natural systems, solid waste services, and forestry services. Next slide. So this is the operating uh, budget summary for tax supported services. Infrastructure services manages the design and construction of the city's assets. And therefore much of their budget, uh, 24.9 million is recovered from capital projects and others for, uh, from a total expenditure budget of $31.1 million. Resiliency and natural systems budget increased by 30,000, which is approximately 1.5% increase. And solid waste services budget is 103.8 million with revenues of 69.9 million from the garbage fee, tipping fees and sale of recyclables. Forestry services budget increased by 395,000, which is approximately 2%. Next slide. Includes an adjustment for potential 2022 cost of living increases, increments, and benefit adjustments. It also includes inflationary and growth increases to the curbside and multi residential collection contracts for garbage, recycling, and green bin programs. The user fees for waste collection are increasing in 2022 by $12 per household for curbside, as well as $6 per household for multi residential for a total of $118 for curbside households and $77.50 for residential households. This uh, I meant for multi-residential households. This can be largely attributed to the 2019 procurement for both curbside and multi-residential contracts for waste collection. Also included is funding to support the projects that required at the landfill and associated facilities. And this requires a 2022 increase of $4 per curbside household and $2 for multi-residential. The service area forecast at $7.1 million surplus in 2021 because of increased recycling revenue and funding, slightly offset by the cost of collecting and processing increased tonnage. There's also a $1.6 million allocated towards our annual goal of planting 125,000 trees. <coughs> Next slide, please. This table reviews the capital budget summary for tax. Environment includes $2 million for natural area acquisitions and $3 million for energy management and investment strategies. Parks, buildings, and grounds is for $400,000 for concrete tree well covers in the Glee to protect our trees. Solid waste includes funding to support the many projects required to maintain our services. Here are some examples. 1.5 million for the Nepean landfill cap repair, 1 million for our leaf and yard waste facility, 18 million for the development of stage 5A to accept waste, 1.9 million for the continued development of the solid waste master plan and component projects, parks pilot and bin delivery, and 500,000 for renewal of solid waste facilities. 
as well as 620,000 for fleet growth and the remainder for service enhancements, such as trail road landfill improvements and gas collection expansion. Next slide, please. So the capital budget of 33.9 million uh, for these services is funded 42% from cash or 14.4 million and 58% from debt or 19.5 million. Uh, we are applying more debt to solid waste projects in order to advance some of the critical infrastructure needs in that program. And a long range financial plan will be coming forward in 2022 uh, along with the, uh, the solid waste master plan. Next slide. So the following three services are included in the draft rate supported budget, water services, wastewater services, and storm water services. Next slide. So the increases in each of these services is aligned with the long range financial plan. Due to growth on, on our estimated volume of water consumption, and incre uh, it, it, which has increased by about 800,000 cubic meters, and the number of properties is also increasing. So uh, even though we, uh, we need to increase uh, overall revenues by 5.4%, the average bill only increases by 4.2%. The overall uh, net impact is zero. This is 100% cost recovery for all these services. Next slide. The budget includes an adjustment for potential 2022 cost of living increases, increments, and benefit adjustments. The budget also includes an increase to the contribution to capital of 5.2 or 5.727 million for water and 4.296 million for wastewater and 9.77 million for stormwater. I'll now pass the remainder of the presentation over to Karina Duclos. Next slide, please. Good morning. The draft 2022 budget includes approximately 264 million capital investment to renew and grow water, wastewater, and stormwater infrastructure that delivers essential services to residents, businesses, and visitors. The city's water infrastructure continues to be in good to fair condition. For the last five years, the city has consistently achieved at least a 98% rating from the Ministry of Environment, Conservation and Parks. The city is responsible for maintaining and renewing over 9,000 kilometers of pipe, two water purification plants, one wastewater treatment plant, close to 100 pumping stations, six communal well systems, and over 6,000 culverts. All the city's infrastructure assets are safe. The total replacement value of water and wastewater assets is nearly 21 billion, about half the replacement value of all the city's major infrastructure assets. Next slide, please. The city would invest 264 million to renew and grow water infrastructure. This number is up from 218 million in 2021. This investment would be funded by reserves, 177.6 million, debt, 74.7 million, development charges, 9.9 .9 million, and revenue, 2.2 million. Next slide, please. Some highlights of the 83 million for drinking water infrastructure include 29.4 million to renew the two water purification plants, an additional funding to build a new intake structure at the Lemieux Island plant and, re <clears throat> and replacing and upgrading equipment. 18.7 million to repair and replace water mains to ensure a continued supply of quality drinking water. And 19.2 million to construct the Manatee Supply Water Main Phase 2, which will improve reliability and additional capacity to the village to the village of Manatee to support development. There is approximately 72 million for the rate portion in the budget for integrated road, water, and wastewater infrastructure. The total investment for integrated road, water, sewer reconstruction projects is 118 million. There is 20.5 million 
to renew integrated water and wastewater infrastructure, including 10 million to repair, rehabilitate, and improve sewers. Next slide, please. Here are some additional highlights, highlights in relation to stormwater and wastewater investments. For the 23 million for stormwater infrastructure, we'll include 17.7 7 million to replace and repair culverts across Ottawa, 1.5 million to rehabilitate storms and, and surface water infrastructure, including creeks, rivers, and ravines, stabilize slopes, and mitigate flooding. For wastewater infrastructure, some of the highlights of the 66 million investments include 16.2 million to repair so, uh, sewage pumping stations, 18.4 million to repair and extend the life of our Robert Picard Environmental Center, 9.8 million to upgrade and renew the existing Richmond pumping station, 1 million investment in the Ottawa River Action Plan and Wet Weather Infrastructure Master Plan. This 1 million investment is comprised of 600,000 for stormwater and 400,000 for wastewater. Next slide, please. In addition to the 3 million for energy management and investment strategy projections intended to reduce energy costs and, green, and greenhouse gas <clears throat> at various city facilities, many climate change initiatives are also a mandate of other standing committees. This include 963 million in spending to continue work on stage two of our light rail system, which is anticipated to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by over 110,000 tons and criteria air contaminants by over 3,000 tons per year by 2048. 17.4 million to support the operational transition to stage two light rail. 55 million to replace 74 40 foot buses as directed by council, the application process is underway for federal funding to purchase these battery electric buses, anticipated to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 7,000 tons per year. 26.5 million for sidewalks, pathways, pedestrian facilities, cycling facilities, active transportation facilities, and missing links. This includes 11.5 million for sidewalk and pathway rehabilitation, 2.9 million for pedestrian facilities, 8.7 million for cycling facilities, 1.2 million for active, active transportation missing links, and 2.2 million for major active transportation structures, and 1 million to support the transition to a greener municipal fleet. Separate from budget 2022, 800,000 in additional funding from the Hydro Ottawa Dividend Surplus was approved by Council last week to support energy evolution priority projects in 2022. I want to thank you for having us, um, all of us here today, and we are now available for questions. Thank you very much. We're going to go to delegations, though, before we go to questions to to staff on the budget. Um, I know before we go to delegations, it wouldn't, be, wouldn't hurt if we had a motion, but I, I think, um, I know Councilman Bernard has been working on a motion with relation to uh, climate change funding, but I know there was some final um, updates to that motion. Councilman Bernard, is that motion ready to be read now or? It's uh, finance staff are just making some final edits. So uh, just give us the, the gist of it uh, yes, before we go yeah, to delegations. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. So the, the motion is essentially to do two things. Uh, one is to um, add a million dollars to the climate change master uh, plan um, uh, projects this year, of which staff have identified a um, uh, similar amount of, of projects. And the second is to look into establishing uh, an energy and emissions fund. Um, this is something that uh, I hope would be a revolving fund based on savings that we achieve from other energy and emissions uh, reductions. 
that we've been seeing in the city uh, and then can then be put forward for other uh, projects of that sort. Um, so I think uh, I'll leave it there. There's a few other things in the motion that I'll read out when it comes, but those are the two basics, uh, Chair. All right, thank you. And I haven't, uh, I'm not aware of any other motions from members of council. So we will go straight to our delegations on this. And we start with Marty Carr from the Alta Vista Community Association. Great. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and, and thank you for having me here today. Um, I wanted to first acknowledge that the issue which I'm presenting is one that sort of cross pollinates uh, two committees uh, as forestry is part of environment and parks as part of community and protective services. Uh, I also wanted to acknowledge I'm well aware of the constraints of the budget uh, and that there's very little leeway. However, I believe strongly that if there were seed money for the initiative that I would present, it has the potential to result in cost savings for the city, both short and long term. I noted as a case in point that in the budget that was just prevented, uh, presented, that there's $1.6 million allocated for planting 125,000 trees. But one wonders when the amount of uh, invasive plants that we have, uh, such as buckthorn in our areas, how many of these will actually survive and how much that cost investment will pay off. Uh, on slide two, uh, just to present, um, ultimately I'm here to request that the standing committee um, consider funds in the budget process to start a co-management program with community groups dedicated to invasive plant management within public spaces. Uh, on slide three, currently City of Ottawa does not have an invasive plant management program. There's website acknowledgement um, of the widespread invasive plants that are in our parks and green space. These include, of course, garlic mustard, dog strangling vine, common and glossy buckthorn, as well as many of the other 25 species that appear in the noxious weed annex of the Ontario Weed Control Act. This same act is what mandates the city to take action regarding wild parsnip, poison ivy, and giant hog hogweed on city property. Uh, I would also mention that this legislation also requires each city and municipality to have a weed inspector. Um, and although I admit to not digging very deep, I could not find who that person in the city of Ottawa was. All indications on the website point to 311 um, as to the call. Um, from all of our interactions with staff, it's clear that staff clearly recognize the need for community groups, the desire of them to get involved in controlling these invasive species. Um, but at times our communications have been very um, challenging in the fact that sometimes we're pointed to bylaws that show that this activity is actually illegal. We know that we can work through the corporate real estate office to get a consent to enter agreement, but there's really no standards in, or, or help in terms of disposing of that material if we were to uh, remove invasive plants. Um, we know that the city, when they published the Urban Forest Management Plan in 2017, they had clear recommendations to deal with invasives that including uh, putting forward a staff position that would have invasive plant removal and working uh, with community groups as part of uh, a, a, a recommendation, I think it was recommendation 22. Um, we all know how important parks and green spaces are. Uh, we've seen that more than ever in the pandemic. Um, from a mental health perspective, an environmental perspective in terms of our biodiversity. They're fantastic for equity seeking groups being able to go out uh, and, and, and be out in the outdoors if they don't have access to private lands. Um, we've never had such a high usage of parks, uh, but unfortunately, these native species are choking, these invasive species are really choking out our native species. They're changing the biodiversity to our areas. They're preventing pollinators um, from, from growing. They're bringing diseases. They're, they're eroding our natural spaces. So just on slide four, I know you're all extremely familiar with the city of Ottawa's new official plan. There's some really ambitious, um, you know, high level policy statements in there talking about protecting our natural in environment, talking about equitable access, talking about protecting trees, talking about protecting wetlands, um, and, and enabling sustainable local food production. But it, it's really hard to imagine how any of this is possible when there's no money um, or no commitment to a program to work with community groups to start removing these invasive plants. Um, you know, just in terms of local food production, you know, we, we see things that would allow food bearing trees that that's never going to be possible in our green spaces as it's now. Um, and there's other municipalities all across Ontario and across Canada that have much more advanced programs um, working with community members on invasive plant removal. So just uh, in terms of um, slide five, just to recap uh, what asking for asking for funding to be committed, you know, small, small start uh, to have a program dedicated to champion a co-management program and include things such as insurance, liability, oversight, how this would get done, training. Um, and this would be something that we know is supported by the Ottawa Invasive um, Plant Group. It's supported by uh, community associations, but we really need that city responsible to be responsible for oversight for, for the community volunteers to take this work on. Um, and just to mention that this request that I'm speaking to you about today 
has been widely supported by a number of community groups and environmental groups uh, across the city. So thank you very much for your time. All right, thank you. I see your councillor, Councillor Cluche, has a question. Thank, thank you, Chair Marfit. And um, Marty, hello, thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Nice to see you. And looking forward to seeing you tonight at the uh, AVCA meeting. Um, and thanks for your engagement. Um, not just, uh, and you know, throughout, throughout on, on a multitude of issues. We've heard about this before, we've been working on this and keep hearing the same thing. And, and you said it in your presentation, the cities are the ones to deal with this, but the city has no money. When you spoke about the very real issue of we, we wanna plant trees, but but uh, the survivability of those trees as they're impacted by invasive species are is a, something we need to deal with and it's a bad situation. And, and I think a volunteer program has a lot of potential and we've heard it before at the ABCA Green Space Committee and Riverview Park and other organized loosely or, or formalized community groups and volunteer groups. And, and confusion, you talked about multi-departments, uh, who, who heads this up, is it parks? which we're dealing with at the CPSC on Thursday or forestry. And we've been told that while mitigating invasive species falls on forestry, permission to do the work in the public space needs to be approved by parks and, and corporate real estate. My question to you is with this situation and a little bit of the frustration of residents, can you think of a time when the public were successful in removing invasive species like buckthorn on their own accord and how did they manage to, to get that accomplished? So there's a couple groups that we're aware of. One, our, our colleagues in Riverview Park Community Association, and I think are, are gonna be speaking here today, who have a consent to enter agreement to, to rehabilitate near the, um, the city lands near the hydro corridor. Um, as well, uh, Rockcliffe Park Residents Association has one with respect to the removal in McKay Lake. Um, there is also, there have been neighbors, that, we're well aware that there's folks that are doing this work um, without having proper authorization. The problem that we get into there is that then there starts the calls to the community associations, the bylaw unauthorized individuals. Um, there's no standards for removal. So, so folks are going in there, they're removing things, you know, piles of sticks are, are left or whatever else. Um, we have quite expansive green space, at least where, where um, you know, from the, in, in my area, at least from, from Heron to Smythe, uh, the, you know, the sort of the old Heron Walkley corridor. Um, and, and so there's lots of folks that, that we know that they're in there. They're, they're trying to do their best. They're trying, they're very interested in biodiversity, but there's no standards. So yes, I'm aware of groups that either have, a, you know, a sanctioned agreement or who don't. You, you, talk, you spoke about other groups. Uh, Riverview Park is uh, um, uh, pre presenting later. Um, what other community groups are supportive? And I know that uh, ABCA is, is plugged into the FCA. Uh, are supportive this far of, of what you're asking for. And, and can you tell us a bit, little bit about the groundwork that you've done on this? So I can't really speak to the group through FCA, um, but just in terms of uh, Cafes Ottawa sent out a message over the weekend, we advised that we were doing a delegation of this and we had support from, I think close to 15, I'm not gonna be able to remember them all, but um, you know, Gloucester Horticultural Society, the Glebe Community Association, Environment Committee, Centre Town Community Association, Old Ottawa South, the, I think it's Enviro Crew, um, the Environment Committee of Rockcliffe Park Residents, Canada Beaverbrook Community Association, Chapel Hill North, I think they might be presenting today. Um, and as well, uh, the, the, the Iola Price from the Rockcliffe Park Residents Association on the Environment Committee. She also said there'd be support from the on Ontario Invasive Plant Council. So we, we had quite a strong response um, for just getting the message out on Saturday already. And I, I've missed a couple of groups in there, I will say. I didn't uh, know sure. them all. Yeah, no, th thank you for that. Um, we're not reinventing the wheel. Um, other cities have these issues and other cities have programs like this in place. And I'll certainly be asking staff about that uh, when we uh, have questions to staff. Um, can, can you speak to, in, in your research, the initiatives of other cities, how are they different? one from another, how successful are they one from another? Do you have any information on that for us? Yeah, I, I will admit to not doing a, a comprehensive scan of all the programs, but we certainly have looked around. I mean, I think London, Ontario has the absolute Cadillac of invasive plant management um, programs. And I mean, I acknowledge when I say that, uh, 
that they of course don't have an LRT, but um, you know, they're, uh, they've done extensive work on invasive plant management. They followed very much the Ontario Invasive Plant Council's um, uh, framework for it. Um, you know, they've got kind of a five pronged approach to it, but there's other cities as well that even if they don't have a formalized strategy, um, you know, looking at city of Guelph, you know, they're using machinery, they're using herbicides to remove these invasive plants, um, you know, and once the areas are under control, they rehabilitate. I think it's uh, city of Oakville has a, a wood re woodland rehabilitation program where they've, you know, they, they tout their successes in terms of removing buckthorn and they take uh, other initiatives, sort of community initiatives with groups. Um, I noted that they have, I think it's, um, uh, what's the, the garlic, garlic mustard weeding community events. And, and, you know, that would probably be a good chance for counselors to participate just as, you know, in a, any other event, uh, going to a bake sale or anything else to have a, a garlic mustard weeding event. Um, so they do those with community groups. So there's, there's quite a lot of different, um, you know, uh, programs across the province, but I will say that in the, brief environmental scan that I did, you know, City of Ottawa is is really, really far behind on this issue. Thanks for that. And um, just one more question, Chair, and I appreciate your leniency, uh, Chair Moffat, because this isn't all necessarily environmental, but, uh, and I will be at um, CPSC. Uh, Marty, just one more question. Do you have any numbers, hard numbers about costs and uh, from other cities and, what we could reasonably expect here in Ottawa and how successful they, they have been in, you know, the value for the, the investment of, of dealing with invasive species. Any, any information at all about that for us to, uh, to take in? You know, I'll admit that I don't, uh, Councillor Cloutier, and I apologize for that. Uh, it nope. was really hard to parse out even looking at the, the different programs. Um, you know, some of these, even in, in London, they talk about how it impacts different areas, just as you said, uh, you know yourself that it, it cross cuts many different areas so I believe that the London they have a really glossy pdf 47 pages and they've got numbers in there um I haven't thoroughly read it yet um but there's other you know I haven't looked deeply into the costing issue for this I, I will admit but you know I know that the budget is constrained um absolutely there's constraints so we're, we're looking for you know a very small amount of money to set up a volunteer co-management program. We have scores of volunteers that are willing to do this, but we're, we're constantly met with the same questions by staff, liability, this sort of thing. You look at the success of cleaning the capital and how we get community events groups involved there. I mean, there's liability there as well. You, you can fall down and, and hurt yourself. You can, you know, um, uh, you know, so I, I think that's something to consider. So no, I don't have, I haven't done the, any direct costing on it. Okay, thanks, Marty, and thanks for that comparison that, that you've just brought forth as, as to how successful programs and community involvement and volunteers can be. Uh, everybody can work safely, and we can attain the objectives of our community. Marty, thanks for presenting to us today. It's always always nice to um, to be with you and to hear from you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Those are all my questions for now. Thank you. Yeah, I think I'm not sure. I think Councilor Clucci spoke to me about bringing something forward. The um, it's important to know if you look at parallels, you know, we at uh, Agricultural Real Affairs Committee back in 2012 uh, started a process which created the wild parsnip marsh management program in the city. It wasn't it wasn't done through the budget process. It was done just as a regular initiative that built into the budget eventually because that's where the conversation evolved into. And it was a program that I think it ended up yielding about $200,000 a year uh, to manage wild parsnip across the city. Uh, and it was across multiple departments because we worked with the uh, parks to do stuff in public spaces, but also um, increased mowing in roadside ditches to control it, to control the spread. So that's probably one of the most invasive species that exists out there because of the, the rapid spread of it uh, throughout Eastern Ontario, all the way down to Belleville. And we also created a wild parsnip uh, stakeholders group with neighboring municipalities, Gatineau, Lanark, Leeds and Grenville, uh, Stormont, Dundas, Glengarry, as well as Hydro Auto, Hydro One, uh, Ministry of the Environment. So we had a big, uh, a big group that would meet uh, regularly. I was on that stakeholders group because you know why not. And we, we were. It was good to be able to work together. Landark had a very difficult time doing the, their wild parsnip management program because of the opposition to any sort of spraying and whatnot and the challenges that existed there. Uh, but it was a good a collaboration between everyone in, involved, including the the uh, Ministry of the Environment. So it's, it is something that we, we have done before, uh, specific to wild parsnip, uh, but 
certainly having that conversation and building off of that uh, as you know relating to others um, can be good as well because i think the um, the invasive species uh, group was also involved in that conversation as well uh, so all right well thank you and i imagine i think from what i gather from this we have a few more delegations to talk about weeds today too so thanks marty all right, our next delegation is Angela Keller-Herzog. Hey, good morning, everybody. Can you hear me? We can. Okay, awesome. So my name is Angela Keller-Herzog, and I'm the Executive Director of Community Associations for Environmental Sustainability. We are a network, as many of you know, that spans rural, suburban, and urban um, areas. I will be speaking on climate finance this morning based on our recent consultation with the CAFE's Climate Caucus and other colleagues will be speaking later, including on city to neighborhood engagement on the invasive species in our green spaces. Um, next slide, please. Many of you will have read about the COP26 climate conference. There were some important outcomes inside deals and there was disappointment with the level of commitment by countries in the final communique. But for sure, two things came out. A, there is a new level of engagement that is an order of magnitude above what we have seen before, including by the Canadian federal delegation. And B, we are told to look at the local level for the actions. Emissions happen at the local level and no level of government can fight climate alone. And councillors, although it may not feel like it sometimes at the Ottawa Council table, the local level has the most tools to act on climate and is clearly the closest to the emitters as well as the people taking the hits. This is the case for both mitigation and adaptation. Next slide, please. In terms of the big picture, delay is the new denial. And we have to be vigilant that we here in Ottawa are not falling into this trap. I would like each one of you to think whether you are in favor of delay or in favor of action and implementation on our climate plan here in Ottawa. If you vote in favor of delay, then you are effectively denying the urgency and reality of the changing climate crisis. Next slide, please. The question that I would like to examine with you here today is whether the City of Ottawa is implementing our climate plan, which did take more than five years to devise. Next slide, please. Let's look at some, next slide, please, thanks. Um, let's look at some points on the radar screen. Um, we have a reduction in the dollars allocated, a 69% reduction year on year. We are not ramping up the effort in terms of FTEs allocated to climate. And we have no long-term financial plan, nor effort to create financing structure for resourcing the climate plan. Um, and I, there's a lot of issues in terms of measurement um, of both dollars and emissions in the climate world. I would like to remind you that energy evolution is over and above business as usual. So we had trees and we had public transit before we had a climate emergency here in Ottawa. So LRT2 is business as usual or business as planned and only LRT3 and the electrification of buses and the electrification of the Trillium line um, would be considered climate action in our local framework. Next slide, please. So CAFES proposes three things for your consideration. First of all, we need stable on budget funding for the climate plan. Um, Energy Evolution has a requirement of just over 600 million per year in capitalization. So a third of that from the municipality would put us in an order of magnitude of 200 million. And I would like to remind you, many of you know this, is that the energy evolution has not just costs, but also revenues and benefits that, that accrue from the investments in energy efficiency, renewable energy, et cetera. Those should be reinvested. That's a really important principle. We had a, a report at Fedco um, this summer showing over 
7 million in energy savings, for example. Secondly, it's hugely important to mobilize community investment and help the community transition and shift to a low carbon economy. The One minute. Corporate, thank you. Corporate emissions are only four to five percent. So investing in corporate building energy retrofits is great, but we also need to have the Community Energy Innovation Fund come back. We need plans to incentivize builders and developers to apply the high performance development standard. Um, we have lots of tools in the toolbox. Next slide, please. Thirdly, we need to scale and resource. We need to ramp up the staffing. We need to make a capital plan and we need to scale. The electric bus pilot is four buses. We heard from finance that there are plans to put 74 more buses. Good move, but I don't think that's on budget yet. And the bus fleet currently is 944 buses. Similarly on the homes and building side. Council, councillors, you need to partner not only with senior levels of government, but with community. Ottawa is prepared to invest in transition, but needs leadership. For example, in renewable energy, you should be leaning on Hydro Ottawa to partner to invest in more renewable energy. Just one That's example. Time. Thank you. The next slide is thank you. <laughs> there we go. All right. Thank you, Angela. A question from Councillor Menard. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, thanks, Angela, for your presentation. Um, I'm wondering, I'm hoping to get your take on, on two things. One, you mentioned partnering with Hydro Ottawa. Uh, we've had discussions in the past with them about uh, the uh, retrofit of our buildings, um, deep retrofits over time, which pay back the municipality. Uh, I'm hoping to get your thoughts on that, uh, given their source of emissions in Ottawa. And the second piece I'm hoping to get your thoughts on are a revolving fund where savings that are achieved from other issues like LED streetlight conversion, our building retrofits, areas where we are reducing costs as a result of uh, early investments can then be reinvested into more emission saving and cost reducing activities. I'm hoping to get your thoughts on those two pieces specifically. Um, okay, so wonderful questions. Thank you very much, Sean. Um, so Hydro Ottawa is a wholly owned um, corporation. It is fully owned by the city of Ottawa. Um, so in, in our view, the city should be giving direction to its wholly owned corporation to include in their strategic plan um, efforts high and low to help us succeed in implementing energy evolution and our climate master plan. Um, I think that the kinds of things that hydro could be doing um, can, again, like there's a vast range. And one issue, for example, and, and you mentioned um, buildings and multi-unit residential buildings. There's a whole bunch of billing and administrative issues that then interact with the incentives on the, the building ownership to invest in deep energy retrofits. So, and so there is some, Behind the behind the meter, um, where hydro could be arranging for paybacks over time, accruing to the building owner, um, that would then incentivize the building owner to take care of commercial building incentive programs, right? But right now, that that is more or less blocked because the benefits of making these investments over the long run do do not accrue to the building owner. So that's just a little example, but Hydro um, also has in turn fully owned subsidiaries like Portage Power um, and Envari. So Envari is an energy services company and Portage Power um, owns renewable energy generation and has invested. Um, so a lot more um, could, be, could be done there. And, and again, I think that that is a, a pretty big area where the city has failed to use the levers of power um, that, that we have. We have two members of council sitting on the board, but I think that function is more to 
participate in knowing what's going on, a monitoring role. And I think what we would need is uh, like a strategic direction. And I believe Hydro is currently in the process of reviewing their strategic plan. So it's kind of urgent actually to do that right now. Um, okay, so your second question was regarding reinvesting. Um, so, so clearly, the, the great thing, um, one of the great in terms of comparing different cities across Canada, um, the Ottawa Climate Plan is, is really excellent for actually having a chapter that tries to do high level costing about how much would it cost and where could some of the funding come from. And in doing that costing exercise, it's also shown that there's significant um, economic benefits that come back, right, from making investments in energy efficiency and energy conservation. So it's only logical to start rolling um, the cost savings back into the whole effort to turn the curve on our climate emissions and our energy consumption. Um, so, so I would hugely support um, doing that. I, I obviously said so in my in my presentation. There was a report that came to Fedco this summer. I think I mentioned it already that actually started counting up some of the energy innovations and cost savings. Um, and there was some recurrence, some one time. And I think that there was $7.7 .7 million um, in like cost savings and, and benefits from doing this energy work. Um, so those monies should be reinvested and, and not just sort of accrue to general revenue. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Councillor McKinney. Thank you, uh, thank you, Chair. Thanks, uh, Angela, for your presentation. Um, always greatly appreciate hearing from cafes, of course. Um, I just want to uh, follow up on some of the questioning from Councilor Menard. Um, so that if we're looking at stable, uh, um, uh, you know, on budget funding for our climate plan, yep. um, you know, being 621 million, I think was the number. And you suggest that we sh as a municipality should be responsible for one third of that. Is that correct? So 200 million. Um, and today, you know, we're resourcing our climate plan for, um, you know, at 0.8 million. So there's a, there's a, a gap, but, but that also includes some of the investments being made, for example, in, in our fleet, et cetera, in some of our buildings, but yours, what, you, what you've pointed out, I'm just trying to do the math. I'm just trying to yeah. figure out how you get from 0.8 million to, uh, 200 and, say 6 million, um, 7 million, I guess it is 207 million. It's, it's a gap, but, but, it, but it, it is, it is there, there are other investments that we can put in there today, but what you're suggesting and, and not wrong is that we're double counting some of them. Like we counted them last year. Now we're counting them next year. Is that, is that correct? Like in terms of uh, LRT? Okay, so this like counting and measurement and what counts and what doesn't like the the climate people spend like at the international level an incredible amount of time uh, working and, and fighting about that right so <laughs> I think that in Ottawa like it's it's a lot simpler so. Um, First of all, it's key to understand that when we started doing our climate plan, we said, okay, there is a business as usual scenario, right? Where the emissions are, are basically flat despite um, growth, right? So there's already in our business as usual, business as planned scenario, um, that there is some energy efficiency and, and conservation. Like we have the beam unit, that's been going mm -hmm. for a long time. We've had the greening the fleet initiative going for a long time. So, so these things are, are not like they're considered part of the business as usual. So what we count then would be like the, the new stuff. And, and there's a big line between like LRT2 and LRT3. And that's given just by the timing of when we started the climate action planning and the, the energy evolution um, plan. So, so that's kind of really important to understand. Now, the other thing is that as, as you know, 
there's room between the capital budget and the operations budget. There's like a gray zone um, and there's sort of sleights of hand that can happen there. Um, but basically the capital budget, we can have some pretty huge numbers and the way it works is that they're spread out over time, right? Um, yeah. So that the city, for example, right now is, is not yet hitting our debt ceiling, right? And our debt ceiling is already much more conservative than the legislated debt ceiling by the province. So there's, there's huge room, both in terms of our own prudence and, and then above that um, even more so. Interest rates right now are low and everybody is predicting that, that with inflation, a rising interest rate, rising costs, and the climate crisis will also drive up costs even more, right? So there's arguments to be made that we should be borrowing now um, and investing now and getting those benefits sooner, both from a climate perspective in terms of lowering emissions sooner rather than trying to wait for 2049 when it's kind of too late. Um, and there's also financial reasons why, to, why we should do that. But what we don't really have is like a separate vehicle um, for where we do it. And for comparison of like some of the orders of magnitude, I mean, I think you're hugely aware that um, we instantly were able to find the 60 million for the library. Um, I think that I read that in the current budget, there is a $120 million capital provision for solid waste management looking forward, even though the solid waste master plan hasn't yet been finished, right? So there's planning and provisioning in other areas, but we don't see the same thing for the climate plan. So there's there's like a huge gap there. And then trotting out the old LRT numbers to say, oh, we're doing things is is a bit disingenuous. Like we need to get real. Um, and anyway, I could go on for a long time. I'm not sure if I've answered your question. Like, anyway, there's- You have, you. Yeah, you have. Um, I guess, you know, and, and we do have a, a motion coming, which we obviously are looking at, you know, stable budget funding. Yeah. Uh, but I think that, and I don't want to push this off, and I don't want to say like next year when we're back here. But I yes. really do think that we need, and I agree with you, and I hope that it comes from, from the work that will fall out of this, this motion. You know, what do we need to spend? What are we spending? what is new, what is operational and capital, and then how do we, like you say, we, we also have cost savings, and if, and how do we, because I think that's another opportunity, right, like reinvesting those cost savings back into uh, our climate action plan, uh, so that we are meeting uh, the goals. We have, we have a, an amazing plan, we do, energy evolution, it, it, it is, I think that this term of council, we really have kind of move that needle in terms of accepting what we need to do, but now it's finding a way to make sure that it's uh, that it's properly scaled and resourced as you, as you so aptly put it. So, so um, like, I, I, I just like, like what you said, I just would like to underline that there is no financial long range plan. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, and I think that yeah. like, even just to put a direction to staff to start working on that, it obviously it again it costs effort and and we don't have staff sitting around, but it's it should be a priority if climate is an emergency. And as as you know, Councillor McKenney, we have the the long range planning in the housing area, which is the other emergency. So I I would definitely argue that to be sitting back saying no, we're not going to make a long range financial plan like that's like okay, like, that gonna, says gonna, something. I'm gonna stop because I'd say getting a bit repetitive. Also, there was just make sure that for delegations. Uh, and counselors, if there's a question, the question can be answered. But in terms of back and forth debate and just just kind of uh, repetition, it's it's unnecessary. Um, yeah, gonna... not recognize recognize that, but uh, but thank you. I I, I do appreciate uh, all that's been raised here today. I agree. Thanks. Right. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Councillor uh, Councillor Fleury. Thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chair, and, and good morning, Angela. Thank you for your presentation. I I won't go back to some of the elements you've, you've raised, because I, I, do, I do see the opportunity that, uh, that you pose in front of us. But I, I want to bring, uh, I, I want to understand your thoughts in relations to where we stand today in the spirit of the budget we have 
specifically when we look at the green fund and the green fleet fund. So we know that there'll be 3 million or so spent in our buildings. And we know that there are fleet decisions uh, over the next little while that might have impacts. What is your advice to council and committee as it relates to both of those measures for, 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 for city facilities and city fleet? Um, I, I'm curious because I, I you probably saw the article today in relation to the um, the Zambonis, uh, the purchase of ice surfacers and, and the electrification of that. Uh, but when we look broadly, we, we do purchase a lot of vehicles. And I'm, I'm curious to, to hear from your perspective, at what point do we hold off on those purchases uh, to make the conversion as we've done for electric buses, for example? So I, I think that if, if we took uh, a long-term analysis and try to figure out like year by year um, how much was being spent over the last say 10 years on on greening the fleet like 10 years ago people already were talking about greening the fleet right this is not something that like people thought of last year um, so I think that the the like there would be sort of like a little bit of a zigzag flat um, pattern um, and the 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 real push in terms of urgency in terms of investment uh, I'm not I'm not seeing it in the budget numbers the the second thing that that is kind of important to understand is the idea of getting locked in to fossil fuel infrastructure so when you reinvest in a gas burning furnace you're saying okay for the next say 15 years, the expected life of this um, infrastructure, I'm gonna be locked in because I'm not gonna wanna throw it out, right? And replace it next year with something else. The same thing I think is true of a diesel bus or a not electric Zamboni, which I, I guess is a cute example to talk about. So I think that we should be asking of this budget um, and I don't have the capacity to do this analysis, how much of it is investments in fossil fuel infrastructure that is locking us into um, a, a like high carbon path and arguably part of our road investments, right? That is betting on more and more and more cars on the road is, is also uh, could be considered fossil fuel infrastructure lock-in. And those roads require maintenance, right? So it's not just that you need to wait till the road's used up, but you need to keep pumping money into, into that. So those are sort of high level um, considerations that, that I think is at the level of the Environment Committee and Council to, to really give direction to staff in terms of um, the, the overall budget. And we don't usually see sort of the carbon considerations as part of budget guidance, but I think that's what we need to do. Um, the climate people also, and Scott, I know I'm going on, but this is a new point. Um, the climate people want to see carbon budgets. And the city of Edmonton, for example, has started to do this international examples also abound where the city says, okay, we can afford this much emissions this year. And then you start going around saying, okay, I wanna see some efficiencies, everybody. And, and um, on the corporate side, we have executive compensation tied to um, driving those efficiencies. So I would hope in 10 years to be making a presentation on, you know, congratulating various members of council and department heads on driving those carbon efficiencies. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Angela. Thank you, Councilor Cloutier. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Angela. I appreciate your delegations uh, today and, and every day. Just two, two um, questions. And with respect to your comment about so many GH, GHGs being produced in, in our cities uh, everywhere and that, that the cities need to be more active. And um, in partnering with other levels of government, just want your comments on two initiatives. Um, the bus conversion fleet, you, you said that there's a four bus pilot program, but we, we have announced uh, that the entire fleet would convert uh, to uh, electric buses. And there's a partnership with the federal government, with the, um, the, the Business Development Bank. Sorry, the name escapes me uh, with respect to that loan. 
is your criticism of that that we're taking too long or it's not aggressive enough or what what is what are your your comments on converting the OC transport fleet? Yeah, I think I think that um, high level perspective that like delay is the new denial um, that I think that really needs to be taken like in, into our heads. Um, and I, I think the reality check, right, and leaders need to be grounded in reality is that the I think the pilot e-buses were supposed to be here in Q4. Um, I don't think that they're arriving on time. I think that the 74, I think that's not yet on budget. Um, it's not the business development bank, it's the infrastructure bank. Um, and I think that we, there is a competitive procurement which is going on. I don't, I don't know the details of that, I'm sorry, but those yeah. are excellent questions okay. to ask. And actually another climate lens um, we should really be putting on to the, the our our procurement, um, yeah. and to okay. make sure that again we don't invest in the fossil fuel infrastructure to lock us in. Uh, yeah, uh, got it. Noted. Agreed. Uh, the other one is that the um, the uh, Building Better Homes Ottawa Loan Program is with the Federation of Canadian Municipalities, the Green Municipal Fund, where where. Uh, residents can um, have a 0% loan to, to improve uh, renewable energy, electric vehicle chargers, mechanical systems that are more efficient. Is that the type of programs, and again, partnering, because I, I believe it's funded by the government of Canada through the um, uh, FCM, um, is, is that the type of programs that you want us to take more advantage of? Is, is, is that the right investment of our um, of, of our resources, both uh, staff resources and uh, the, the committee's uh, strategic plans going forward? So I, I think that, that the Better Homes program is an absolutely like excellent initiative. And, and I'm, I'm very, very impressed by how much homework and legwork the city staff have done on that. Um, I, I think again, they're like a little bit short on, on staff resources and the ones we have working on it are working super hard. Um, but as I pointed out, it, it really needs to be scaled. So yes, we need to learn from it. But if, again, it's like this climate thing, it's like there's orders of magnitude. If we're doing 600 homes and we need to do close to 400,000, um, I, I mean, something needs to happen between those, those two numbers. Um, and I think that we there's a lot of room on on the incentives and encouragement side. So better homes, yes, excellent first little step. Okay, Angela, thank you. Thanks for coming out today. Thank, thank you, you Councillor. Thank you, Angela. Appreciate your time. Our next delegation is Katie Morissette with the Chapel Hill North Community Association. There we go. Thank you, everyone, and good morning. Um, thank you, Chair and Councillors, for this opportunity to speak today. Um, I also want to thank the other uh, community groups that we've heard from today, cafes, and uh, for spearheading these initiatives and for their presentations. Um, my name is Katie Morissette. I'm the president of the Chapel Hill North Community Association here in Orleans and in this ward. I'm here today to echo the calls for supporting investments in green spaces that we've heard from other community groups and to provide a voice for uh, what I like to refer to as the Orleans Ravines, a collection of urban forests and ravines found throughout the East End. Uh, these natural areas are not part of Parks and Rec's budgets um, and they've had minimal proactive maintenance over the years. Uh, trails and green, oh, uh, sorry. Um, yes, trails and green spaces, they've got you know, tremendous benefits for uh, the health of people and environments, I won't get into that, um, but our residents really love these spaces and they want to help to protect them. Next slide, please. Uh, so yes, we're here to help. Uh, community groups across the city, including here in Orleans, they're willing and able to help take care of our green spaces, 
including efforts like we're here today to prevent and remove invasive species that are taking over some areas in our forest. Uh, to do so, we've got three main things. We have the people and volunteers, uh, we have the motivation to get involved, and we have the time to roll up our sleeves and get our hands dirty. That said, we are running into some challenges in doing so, and we need some help from the city. First, we need permission. We need permission from the city to access the lands to carry out this maintenance and stewardship work. Um, we need uh, funding. Um, we, you know, we're talking about the budget today, so we need city funding to help pay for the uh, required insurance, uh, native plants, and other equipment. And lastly, we need support. Support from a city staff point person to help navigate city processes and protocols, uh, give training for proper um, removal techniques. Um, and it might also be helpful for the city to launch a social media campaign talking about what bylaws apply to these natural areas to help raise awareness about you know, how dumping yard waste and forest can actually introduce invasive and non-native plants to the area. Um, or how better managing rainwater on individual properties can help reduce erosion throughout the creek system. Um, you know, community groups, we understand that the pandemic has created funding pressures all around. You know, we feel it too. Um, but it's also created a renewed interest in connecting with nature and building community. I'm really confident that if we had this type of stewardship program in Ottawa and Orleans, starting with a focus on removing invasive species, um, that it would help increase citizen engagement, people's sense of belonging, and civic pride working together towards a common goal. Next slide, please. And that's the end of my presentation today. Thanks again for the time to speak to you today and for your consideration in Budget 2022. All right, uh, thank you very much. Katie, any questions for our delegation? Yes, Councilor Menard. Thanks very much, Chair. Thanks so much, Katie, for being here. I, I'm wondering if there's been discussions with, with staff or uh, your council just about um, like costing or program setup, how this could work. Um, just looking for more details about what we could do to, to help in the, in the near future. Thank you, um, Councilor Menard. We have been, um, I mean, in terms of our green spaces, there has been lots of discussion, even in terms of um, how to maintain the trails in, in, the, in the ravine system, um, specifically about invasive species. Um, we haven't costed it out, um, but time and time again, it's we've been um, met with the line, you know, city doesn't have resources for this type of kind of proactive stewardship work, um, you know, we, as a community association, we're also sort of getting started, getting, uh, you know, um, having, trying to identify revenue sources and that type of thing. Um, you know, insurance rates for associations are, have increased, you know, a lot um, since the pandemic. So we're just, we're still trying to find revenue, but um, it's not, and it's not just about the funding, it's about, um, sort of navigating the processes and where do we start? How do we learn from other groups that um, are doing similar work and we can kind of build on best practices and and get kind of a streamlined approach across the city? That'd be helpful. Well, Thank you. That is very helpful. And I would just suggest if, if, if you'd like, um, I'd be happy to chat with yourself and Nick Stowe and others at the city to see mm -hmm. what we can do uh, to, to help further it. If it is a funding issue and a um, mechanism that we need to see some more modest investment here, then, then we should talk about what that would take. So uh, I'd be sure. open to that conversation with you and other city staff that, that do work on, on these types of issues. So I appreciate you, your um, advocacy and delegation. Thank you. Thanks for your support. Thank you. I will say, I know Councilor Cloutier had uh, has some intention to bring forward a, an inquiry, which I know might sound small, but the reality is what it does is it gets specific questions to specific answers or specific answers to specific questions, and then actually gets them back on the agenda for, for a discussion. Once you get an inquiry back, it comes as an agenda, you can actually create it as an agenda item, and then you can build off of that and actually take action items from that uh, point forward and start to give proper direction on, on a specific matter. And it's a, it's a good process to get something uh, in front of council for consideration. 
Kasakuchi just unmiked himself. So what's up? And, and I'm I'm ready with that inquiry, but usually it's at the end of the. Oh, I know it's at the end. I just wanted to mention it now. At the end of this item, at at, at yeah. your leisure uh, chair. Yeah, I just thank wanted you. to bring it up now, just because of the the context of the discussion here. All right, uh, thank you. Appreciate thank that. You. Thank you, Katie. Our next speaker is Marion Sikursky. Oh, you're just on mute there. There you go. Um, Chair Alfred, Vice Chair Menard, and Councillors, good morning. Uh, my name is Marion Sikorsky, and I thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today as a concerned citizen. Um, I finally returned to Canada and New Edinburgh in particular in the middle of the pandemic. And I'm only beginning to work on environmental issues here in Ottawa. So I will not speak to budgetary details in my contribution today, but I do want to share with you my sense of urgency when it comes to climate change. Um, I have two preteen children and frankly, I am concerned for their future. As you are well aware, limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees is the defining challenge of our lifetime. The difference between 1.5 degrees and 2 degrees is frankly frightening when it comes to the natural, economic and ultimately personal impact. I have made changes in my personal life, I've adjusted my family's diet away from red meat and dairy, I've changed my consumption habits to reduce our environmental impact, I've worked with schools and contributed to local media to raise people's awareness. These are the avenues I have, but you are really in a unique position. We follow COP26 and it's hugely important as it is. What you do at the city level will determine if we stay within 1.5 degrees. You likely have more power than many of the negotiators in Glasgow to make a difference. The pathways to net zero have been studied in much detail, and we know it's possible to achieve net zero by 2050, but it requires urgent action in this decade. And it doesn't cost the world. Considering the enormous cost of health impacts and economic losses from ext increased extreme weather events, investing in climate change mitigation and adaptation with urgency is the obvious choice. And done right, it results in a healthier, more equitable society with new job opportunities. Two important avenues are decarbonizing electricity, where Ontario has already made good progress. And in this regard, I commend you on your initiative to further ask Ontario to phase out gas. The other avenue is switching transport and heating from fossil fuels to electricity, which will require increasing electricity supply. I commend you for the actions you have taken to reduce the institutional emissions, driving down methane emissions at the trade world facility and allocating budget to electric buses. But you also need to bring the community along. I am beginning to inform myself about the official plan, the climate change master plan, etc. But that's because I am interested in these issues. But in my demographic, a lot of people don't know about these important policies. Reach out to them, bring them along, think of creative ways to engage them. How can you reach the wider community? Maybe it's possible to involve universities to come up with a comprehensive information campaign. Maybe have a competition, whether it's about green architecture, new materials, design, or a writing competition on environmental issues that gets groups involved and informed about Ottawa's plans that otherwise might not get your message. And these methods aren't even very expensive, I think. So how can you encourage people to transition to electric vehicles? It requires public infrastructure, pricing signals, charging stations, and again, people's buy-in. Besides transport, we must ensure we very quickly move to low or zero emission buildings. I live in New Edinburgh, near Beechwood and Vanier. And we're expecting two to three large apartment developments on Beechwood and even bigger buildings along Vanier. And I totally embrace intensification, but it fills me with dread to think that these are likely using fossil fuel technology and locking in greenhouse gas emissions for decades. At the current property prices, likely a lot of these condos will be investment properties. And understandably, no investor will want to spend money to transition a new building from fossil fuels to zero emissions if they can collect money as is. So these buildings are locking in greenhouse gas emissions for their life cycle of many decades. Please bring in regulations and incentives to drive a green transition in buildings as soon as possible. Require new buildings to have an energy pass indicating their emission standards. This has been done in other jurisdictions and it influences consumer choices and investment decisions, steering consumers and, inv and investors in the right direction. 
I was in Germany this past summer and I was amazed at the changes I saw within just two years. I took a train and there are fields of solar panels, solar panels on private buildings, publicly accessible electric vehicle charging stations. A majority of the states in Germany are now requiring solar on all new buildings, including residential and even on parking lots. This is just to say that the right policy signals and matching budget allocations can result in the rapid changes we so urgently need. We need ambitious goals, but this is really the decade to act. And due to the cumulative effect of CO2, mostly from buildings and transport here, we need to act fast. Our actions this decade, both individually and as a community, will determine if we even have a chance to stay anywhere close to 1.5 degrees. We really cannot act soon enough. Please use the authority you have to drive the green transition in Ottawa, and please do so with boldness and with urgency. Because looking to 2030, we have less than nine years to get it right. So thank you um, for the opportunity to speak today to you. Uh, thank you for your presentation today. I don't see any questions. So thank you again for your time. You. Our next delegation comes from the Friends of Riverview Park Green Spaces, Anna Niedaswawska and Ron Ridley. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I had to unmute my microphone. Um, and thank you very much, councillors, for the opportunity uh, to speak this morning. Um, as Councillor Moffat said, uh, my colleague Ron Ridley and I are both here on behalf of the Friends of Riverview Park Green Spaces. Uh, it's a grouping of residents from the community of Riverview Park, and we are in Ward 18. It's a fairly new initiative, and it's an arm's length initiative, which is supported very actively by the Riverview Park Community Association. My colleague, uh, who's on this morning as well, Ron, is actually the uh, vice president, the recently elected vice president of the RPC and we have both lived in the community for over 30 years, so it's an area we know uh, very well. We're here this morning to really very strongly support what we've heard, both from the Alta Vista Community Association and as well from uh, Katie from the uh, Orleans Group, which, by the way, we were not aware of. Uh, we'd like to have these contacts. Um, we're really in favor of the budget next year, uh, having a budget allocation uh, to strengthen and to establish, first of all, but then to strengthen any kind of co-management programs or initiatives within the city, or at least a coordinator position to serve as a liaison between community groups and the various departments in the city administration that, of course, need to be consulted and or involved in the process of addressing the issue of invasive species. Uh, we really believe, and uh, I will share some of our uh, recent experiences on this, that this would go a long way to streamlining and facilitating applications for permits in the city, as well as information sharing among community groups and with the city. Other, of course, potential tasks, and uh, a couple of speakers have referred to that before, is the all-important public education campaigns that we need in the city on invasive species, as well as training for volunteers for the disposal of, in of invasive species. As we see it, there are really two issues that the committee might want to consider. They're linked, uh, but different. One is access, and that's the authorization or the permit to do the work that is required. And two is funding to help volunteers and community-based groups such as ours carry out and do the removal work. And then, of course, to dispose of the removed plants in ways that will not exacerbate the problem. So a funding uh, a coordinator or a program would really help to address the access question, but funding is also required for community groups to be able to buy supplies such as gloves, plastic bags for buckthorn stump control and removal, and of course to support the effective disposal of invasive plants. Um, 
just uh, just to say that we in our community like many other areas of the city have observed the proliferation of invasive plants in our area we have an issue of garlic mustard dog strangling vine and buckthorn but this year wild parsnip has appeared in a number of our green spaces and that of course is a concern also, we know that invasive plants are appearing in people's private gardens. Many people don't know about this. But also in our neighborhood and in others, but we here have a five kilometer long utility corridor on land that actually does not belong to the city, but belongs to Hydro One. One minute. This, sorry, this is one of many such utility corridors, 200 kilometers worth of green spaces in the Ottawa area. So this is a city problem and a community problem that we're trying to address. Our experience has been that going to the city to get a permit for a consent to enter agreement takes about four or five months. It's complicated. We thought it was parks, we thought it was forestry, but no, it's that. So there are many issues. And again, before I finish, I'd like to reiterate our very active and strong support for some budgetary allocations by this committee to do this work in, in our communities. So thank you very much. And we're open to questions. All right. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Anna. Thank you, Ron, for being here as well. We do have a question here from your counselor, uh, Jean Cloutier. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, Ron. It's nice to, to see you. Thank you both for coming and, and for your work with the Friends of uh, Riverview Park Green Space and, uh, and the Hydro Corridor. And, and I know that we're meeting uh, again later today at about, uh, at about four. And Anna, you, you spoke with respect to the Hydro Corridor, um, a, a public space, but not necessarily city owned. And you spoke about the difficulty, the frustration, uh, corporate real estate, parks, forestry, Hydro One. A and I know that with, with Ron and Anna and, and, and your good work, um, th there's been some removal. Uh, but can you talk a little bit more? I, I think you might have had more to say. Can you elaborate a little bit more on the challenges of removing those invasive species a bit, whether it's removing the, the species itself or in these types of spaces and, and public green spaces. And again, not always city owned, but space that is public and, and that the residents of, of Ottawa of Riverview Park walk through and, and that need to be protected. So one of the first challenges as regards to uh, the Hydro One corridors, uh, is of course a requirement uh, that there needs to be a secondary land use agreement uh, and uh, our group has been indeed in conversations with uh, with the councillor Cloutier to be to to see how we can move this along and to make it a much simplified process we really believe if there was a citywide agreement between hydro one and for instance the city of ottawa where groups such as ours could access um, the these properties to do some work some maintenance work because we know that hydro one does not touch invasive species um, in in their maintenance program and so there's a lot of scope uh, but this and uh, i'm glad to see that uh, that that uh, councillor kathy curry is also on this committee um, i believe that there is uh, certainly the example of the morgan's grant uh, project uh, that is city owned. So there are specific cities that are different in each of our areas, but certainly there would be room for some um, shared thinking and some strategies. We know that other groups are also interested, such as the Ottawa Stewardship Council, um, to do this kind of thinking. And we would hope that through uh, the, uh, Councillor Cloutier's working group, we could advance in some of those sort of on a medium and longer term um, basis. But, um, but just perhaps three comments on uh, the important question that Councillor Cloutier has uh, raised in terms of uh, removal of species. One is that different plants 
uh, need different techniques. So garlic mustard, dog strangling vine is not the same as buckthorn. So that's the first thing to keep in mind. The second thing I think to keep in mind is that there's uh, also a um, best time of the year to do work on these various uh, species, whether we're talking about dog strangling vine again or buckthorn that we want to prevent the proliferation of seeds. And similarly with uh, garlic, garlic mustard that needs to be done in the, at the beginning of the year. If, if we in the springtime, if we want to uh, even think of controlling this issue. And the third item, which I think is relevant to the discussion that we're having here today, that this is not a one time operation. Uh, these, need, these efforts need to be sustained over a couple of years at least, two or three as a minimum, and probably ongoing <laughs> forever. Uh, and so um, that, that is something uh, that speaks to the need for some kind of sustained and stable uh, funding for this work. Uh, based on our experience, um, two challenges come to mind. The first one is relatively poor pub public awareness to identify some of these uh, invasive species and also the removal techniques that might be involved. I, I, I'm sorry. Um, so that is um, one thing that I'd like to say. And the other one, of course, is financial resources. So that's a challenge to cover uh, the cost of actually removing such things as buckthorn. Uh, some of these bushes, some of these are bushes, but others are fairly significant, almost trees. And so there is a, a cost. Now the city removes these kinds of things from certain lands. Uh, but community groups such as ours do not have access to this service. And so whether it means enabling groups as ours to access these services that are already carried out by the city in some areas, or else provide funding for us to actually do this work uh, would, be, would be very helpful. So thank you, Councillor, for that question. Anna, thank you very much. And I, I may know, you know, the legislation, the education of people to remove the awareness of the problem, the resources. You're absolutely right. And I couldn't agree with you more. And, and yes, to, to Councillor Curry, I had exchanged with former Councillor Suds with respect to Morgan's grant. And Anna is absolutely right. It is a little bit of a different circumstance, but there are some similarities. So uh, Councillor Curry, while well, I thought I'd give you a chance to find out where your office is and where the supply uh, cabinet is, uh, we'll be in touch. Um, Anna and Ron, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councillors. Thank you. Our next speaker, sticking with Canada North, Barbara Ramsey. Barbara Ramsey, going once. Just trying to locate her chair. Okay, okay. I'm informed that she is in the panelists uh, area. Okay. Oh, here we go. Yeah, there you go. That's why we couldn't see it because it was written as something else. Well, uh, and I did have, I was there and got drawn go. just at the moment. So I apologize for that delay. No worries. Thanks, uh, Chair Moffat. Good morning, uh, Vice Chairman Art and Councillors. And uh, if I could give a special shout out to my new Councillor from Canada North, Kathy Curry. Uh, thank you. Uh, the last time I was here, and when I'm usually with you, I'm speaking as the chair of the Canada Green Space Protection Coalition. Uh, I still serve there. I haven't left. But today I wear another of my hats, and that's Treasure of Cafes. As I think you know, Cafes is a longstanding assembly of community associations advocating for environmental sustainability here in Ottawa. But what you may not know is that we actually formally incorporated in 2021 as a not-for-profit and have been actively developing a defined organizational structure, operating plans, and are, are working to secure ongoing development funding. 
In fact, two of our key and, and current partnerships, one is with Carleton University, and we're working on a community engagement project there around 15-minute neighborhoods, a, a topic I know you know well, as well as with the City of Ottawa on the Neighborhood Canopy Regeneration Project. You also heard earlier from your familiar CAFE's connection, Angela Keller Herzog, about the climate master plan approved in January 2020 that remains without significant and designated funding. My goal today is similar and singular. I want to remind you of another way to address your budget challenges in, in your draft budget 2022 as you work to fulfill your mandate of environmental protection. I'm here to ensure you're aware of an equally limiting dynamic that is preventing the implementation of another important initiative, the Urban Forest Master Plan, untapped resources. The UFMP was approved by the previous council in 2018 and is closing out its first four-year management term presently in 2021. CAFES understands that the staff are working to provide you an update on that plan and, and its progress in early 2022. Regrettably, CAFES and our CAs can describe missed opportunities and deliverables, many of which you've heard about already from delegations today, that were preempted as a result of budgetary restrictions adopted in the intervening years. My, my particular example is one you've been hearing about today, and it's a community stewardship program to protect and improve our green spaces through the eradication of invasive species. As you've heard, all of these species jeopardize existing and desirable plant life and biodiversity, and in fact, compromise our public safety. This issue is not new and was specifically identified in 2018 UFMP, along with the best practices in other cities. The GTA, for example, to Councillor Cloutier's earlier question. And I quote from the UFMP, departments active in urban forestry are increasingly recognizing the importance of having the community aware of the benefits of and engaged in urban forest stewardship. It was written into the plan and it was factored into the deliverables of the plan because the UFMP concluded in recommendation number 22 that we must expand community engagement, public education and the marketing of urban forestry. To that end, an FTE was designated to provide community engagement and stewardship related specifically to the regeneration of the urban canopy, parks and green spaces, co-management of invasive species, the One mitigation minute. of heat islands and stormwater events. At various times since 2018, staff have provided cafes with a number of reasons as to why a co-managed solution to invasive species specifically is not at hand. You've heard from a number of organizations that work alongside cafes and have come forward. Today, I would ask you to discuss and affirm with the staff the following opportunities in keeping with what you've already heard. Confirm the funding in the 2022 budget for the FTE agreed to in 2018 UFMP to support the development of community environmental engagement and stewardship. And also confirm that this FTE assignment will be operational priority in 2020 and that their performance scope will include working to engage community volunteers on a responsive basis in stewardship and co-management for deliverables of programs like the invasive species that you've heard about from Marty, Katie, Anna, and, and Ron. That's time. We're, thank you. Happy to take your questions. All right, uh, thank you very much, Barbara. I'm not currently seeing any questions. Uh, so thank you for your presentation. Oh, no, sorry. sorry. I'll, I'll just jump in here. Yeah, go <laughs> thank ahead. You. Thanks so much. Sorry for the late uh, hand up there, but um, Barbara, you mentioned something late in your presentation around the FTE from 2018, and I just I want to be sure I, I see some uh, an FTE allocated in this 
budget um, that I believe uh, takes care of that. I'll ask staff about it, but um, uh, what is your understanding of, of what staff have said or your counselor has said about why that FT wasn't uh, staffed? Uh, I just want to get more information about that piece around uh, the urban forest management plan. Absolutely. Well, to be to be fair to my counselor, she's uh, very busy ramping up right your, now. Your so old counselor, sorry, <laughs> not not the my new old one. Counselor. Yes, yes. Or <laughs> if there's any discussions you've had with staff or, or counselors about it, I don't yeah, mean to uh, certainly your counselor. Certainly, Sean. Cafes has had a, has had ongoing and has ongoing discussions and relationships with with senior staff, and there is some, some has been some suggestion that that FT is in this budget in some capacity. What is not clear is uh, the work plan for that individual. And there's some understanding that there are priorities ongoing with the staff around forestry plans, et cetera. And it is not clear to us, to be fair and honest, that uh, the staff are focused on a community stewardship plan, despite it being described and uh, an early first four year deliverable out of the UFMP. So we lack clarity and I'm not able to answer that question for you. So it would be uh, an appropriate ask, I think, from our perspective. Okay, thank you for that uh, clarification. I appreciate it. You're welcome, thank you. All right, thank you. And thank you again, Ms. Ramsey. Our next delegation is Dave Coyle. Dave will be followed by Tim Lash and Joan Freeman. Dave, go ahead. Good morning. Um, just setting up a slide. Uh, good morning, uh, chairs, vice chair, and counselors and other delegates. I've learned a lot about plants. I just wanted to talk uh, briefly on the budget 20. 22 climate implications page 31 and this basically talked about funding which a lot of people have talked about this morning for climate change in comparison to work that we started back in 2014 funded by the ieso which is the person that uh, buys and sells power in um, ontario and some of the work that we had done in ottawa on human activity and now we're starting to call it the empty room syndrome. And it comes out of work that deals with living buildings. Living buildings are buildings that happen after they've been built and when people start to occupy them and use them. And what we're discovering in very detailed research, especially in Ottawa, is that a maximum occupation of a building can sometimes reach as high as 15%. In 2019, I met with uh, Janice and discussed um, her city insight model that she was working on. And a lot of this information is coming from the climate change master plan data in which we've merged it with a lot of corporate uh, level uh, information but also now as a business owner and a resident in Riverside Park and a recently elected director, I've become interested in Riverside Park. So I wanna take you through a bit of a journey that speaks to the climate implications as per page 31, but when compared to the work that we've been doing, might look somewhat incomplete, understanding your, um, desire to fund and move forward. Next slide, please. In order for us to understand this model that the um, Climate Change Master Plan had, we had to take this new interpretation of Ottawa called transects. And as you know, the new official plan, the transportation plan, are all now starting to base on a more micro zoning of Ottawa to understand human activity um, for homes, residents, and such. As we drilled through this model, trying to make it relevant to each of the councillors, um, especially to uh, my councillor, Riley Brockington, um, 
we have had discussions and were surprised to find initially that Somerset, mainly because of the parliament precinct, was the largest emitter of greenhouse gases. But the second largest ward was River Ward. And this is when you consider that Kippisippi has Tunney's Pasture, the Civic Hospital, um, Capitol has Carleton University, Chio at Alta Vista are large emitters. And I have to admit, I, I look at Ottawa as a whole. I was surprised to find I, that River Ward was number two. So I thought maybe it was the, the cows at the experimental farm. Um, <laughs> sorry, I haven't solved that problem yet. So next slide, please. So as we go down, and what we're seeing here is a visualization, again, of the great data that the city of Ottawa has of all the address points across Ottawa, about 350,000 of them where, where people are. And just to the right of the bubble um, in the almost center screen is the area of Riverside Park um, that I've become very interested in and have lived there for the last 40 years. One minute. So at the bottom, as you look at the different areas, um, next slide, please. You start to see that in 2020, Ottawa paid 1.2 billion in electrical. This was up $100 million from the previous year and mainly due to residential rate payers. Meanwhile, the empty building syndrome existed and that stayed constant at about um, 700 million. So the 300 was on the wrong slide. So residential rate payers are starting to bear the cost of working at home, I assume. But when we checked with the IESO and the OEB, consumption had not gone up. Next slide, please. So we need to complete the final implications of page 31, the climate implications that are laid out of the rate increase, the travel implications of people that are at home and and at the office, and basically empty rooms in the buildings. And a suggestion would be to implement a living building rate in which hydro or the cost of utilities in general would be paying a premium for empty space, which is tying up um, not only land, but it's also tying up um, costs of uh, the infrastructure for the city. That's time. And that's a thank you. Next slide. Okay, thanks very much, uh, Mr. Coyle. Looks like we have uh, one question from committee members. It's Councillor Brockington. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Thanks, Dave, for your presentation. I, I love the analysis and um, I don't have a question. I just wanna let you know, I, I will commit to immersing myself in your report and I think I'll follow up with you directly. So I just wanna appreciate your work in this regard. It, it's somewhat surprising because with River Ward's abundant green space, not just the farm, but the whole river corridor that we have, one would think, one would conclude that perhaps our Ward's GHG emissions would be at least in the average, maybe not at, at one end of the spectrum. So. I will admit I'm a little surprised with, with the conclusion, but I will uh, immerse myself in the report and I will reach out to you. So thank you today. Okay, okay thanks, Councillor. Yes, that was a very interesting uh, presentation. Thank you, Mr. Coyle. Uh, next up on our list is uh, Tim Lash. Is Tim Lash with us, uh, Chris? He is in voice. Oh, excellent. There you are, Tim. Thank you. You can go ahead. You have five minutes. Okay, thanks. Um, I have uh, given a presentation into, uh, into council. I will try and skip re any repetitions of all the context that's already been given about the urgency of uh, climate and the centrality of cities' roles in that. Um, my comments are addressed to you uh, in this committee as leading the council for um, activity in the city and, and uh, in the community um, for climate. 
Um, we know that climate is more than the business of just this council. I'll end actually <clears throat> with a motion uh, for you to consider uh, giving to council. And it's a motion for that there be included in the budget format, a separate consolidated section for the budget uh, for climate. Um, at the moment, we actually, and I, the, I would say that the, there's the discussion has pointed out that we don't now actually have a workable climate budget in this uh, overall budget. Um, we've heard about it being low, the, the amounts being low and slow. I want to talk about the transparency. Um, there's no overview. You can't really tell what's what. Um, it's not complete in that there's not a consolidated revenue side. There's an incoherence in the climate parts because um, mainly due to the segmented responsibilities of the different committees. So in short, we don't have actually a workable climate budget. Um, there are some actions to be done now. I'll skip the ones that are uh, related to low and slow budget. Um, I think that the city I'm recommending should have a consolidated budget section in the budget for climate, which is referenced back to council committees in their segments for action. It's really important to show the revenue side. There's no doubt that, that we are way beyond regular city business as usual budgeting. And I think it might be useful to in fact, organize some kind of a climate funding tiger team, but the budget itself, the section should show the full spectrum of where revenue is coming from. Stable operating funds, grants that are being sought, borrowing, green bonds, and also investment plans and partnerships, um, which will enhance climate business opportunities. We need, the, the city can right now, I think, get become more transparent in its budget, showing specifically how budget expenditures in this climate, showing in the climate section, how they are related to GHG reductions. I will mention one particular uh, thing that, that is a, a looming challenge with Ottawa Hydro and others. What is the city doing and how much money is it devoting to transforming the energy supply for Ottawa as a whole so that it will be electrified in step with the needs to electrify? Uh, I will say I, I am 100% in support of this, this committee in, in, in leading council and the community on this. Um, and this leads me then to put a motion and uh, Chris, could we have the motion page three of my submission brought up? Oh, Mark, thank you. So the first whereas, oh, I'll wait till it's on screen. Is that going full screen? There we go, thank you. The first whereas is essentially that we cannot fail on climate and we cannot fail just because of inattention to budget. The second where, whereas is that succeeding with climate with the kind of long-term transformations that we need has to be done together through cooperation and partnerships. The third whereas is essentially saying the cooperation and partnerships depend crucially on shared communication, understanding and trust in budgeting resources and expenditures. So I would invite this committee to consider a motion to make a recommendation to council that there be a separate section, the budget include a separate section that shows the consolidated complete city climate budget referenced back to council committees for management of the actions. And that a second part could be independent, but a second part of the motion is that the 30 seconds. Climate section should have a table of planned expenditures by activities by GHG targets. And finally, a table of expected and intended resources, uh, revenue resources by amount related to each climate activity. Thanks very much. I think this would be a modest change to the budget format, but could have a huge beneficial effect on internal city communications and above all, communications with the public. There's no need to be as frustrated as many people have been in trying to figure out what's going on with climate in this budget. So thank you very much. And um, 
way to go on things like the uh, better homes. This, the, this is work and, and this committee is positive. Thank Thanks you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Lash. That's uh, that is helpful. I think in your suggestion, we do have this discussion often, uh, either at agenda planning or um, internally, about a roll up of the climate actions from different uh, line departments and uh, how they're uh, also you know implicated in climate change. So I know the chair and I have had this discussion. I know staff have put together. Um, a, uh, a summary of those, but I think to your point, what you're looking for is is uh, to have that as part of the budget itself up front initially, uh, where you can see those climate investments and the GHG associated with them uh, over time. So it's a it's a good suggestion, um, and uh, you know appreciate that motion. Did you want to respond to what I've said? And if if uh, not, I'll hand it back to the chair. Uh, thank you. I would like to. Um, and just to say that um, I, the earlier discussion with by councillors with Angela Keller Herzog has raised really important points about what gets counted in climate budget, and that should be part of the wrap up. Thank you. Very good. Thank you very much, Mr. Lash. I think you had a good presentation and uh, appreciate these uh, these views. Uh, Chair, back to you. Thank you, Councillor. Our next speaker is, and thank you, Tim. Our next speaker is Joan Freeman. Hi there. Good. I'm just waiting for my thing to load. Okay. Hi. I think I've appeared. Some of you know me already. I've appeared before. My name is Joan Freeman. Uh, I'm speaking today basically as a private citizen, but also as a member of cafes, pops, and a variety of other groups. And before I get into talking about Ottawa's climate budget, I'd like to recognize three groups that have helped me understand this very complicated budget. It's not as hard as the official plan, but it's complicated. The first are the Southern councillors and the budget consultation they held, Cloutier, councillors Cloutier, Menard, Brockington, and Deans. The second is CAFES and Angela Keller Herzog. There's been a pile of work done from them. And the third is a group called C3, which is a group of eight uh, concerned and committed retired climate people. Um, today, I wanna to talk about Ottawa's budget and if it treats the climate emergency or in fact, any emergency is a real emergency. So next slide, please. Let's look at some key numbers. Uh, it's hard to tell how much the budget of the budget is being spent on climate activities because as Tim has just said, it isn't broken down in the budget in any way you can understand. And I agree with Councillor Fleury, the process and what is presented is unsatisfactory. But what we have in front of us is uh, hopefully from what was in the staff report. And that does tell us that there is a capital budget uh, of about 36.7 million when you take out the overcounting for the LRT. And it also there's absolutely nothing being spent on climate adaptation. I'll get to the significance of that later. So what we have is a business as usual budget. This is not a budget for a climate emergency. I'm talking about a climate here, but I'm, I'm sure it's not a budget for any emergency, including housing. Uh, uh, today, I'd like to propose a budget for implementation of what I consider to be three pieces of the climate change work that your committee is responsible for, I believe, and they're under your purview. Uh, that is implementation of energy evolution, climate change master plan, and resilience projects. And what I mean by projects are these activities, which are the needs include planning, testing, supporting, galvanizing the larger climate investments that will be coming. Uh, I was gonna use an analogy for an engine, but I guess I should use something green. So think of this as a electric car, if you will, all of these investments, your part of the, the, the project part is the computer. Uh, in the 2022 budget, the budget for the computer is 800,000, that's it. This is based on the Ottawa Hydro Dividend Surplus. We all know that that's unstable, but I'm just going to continue. Uh, from the city reports, what we actually need is 30 million to implement energy evolution projects so we can galvanize the public and do all of the things that other delegations have talked about so we can figure out how to do, uh, get all these financial instruments and so we can test um, and build capacity. I don't know what's needed for a climate change master plan or the resilience. It's not anywhere that I can find to do these projects, but I'm guessing it's around 2 million. 
that's only 32 million to make a huge difference. And uh, I think, and with that investment, you will be able to get the engine going that we need to get going. So that's really half of the 65 million that was easily found for the uh, library suddenly. So I think we should, you should really think about doing something about this. Uh, the rest of the presentation presents the urgency of the need to build and fund what, what is that computer now. If we have the time, we'll go through it quickly. If not, I would like you to ask, I suggest looking at the slides later. But first, I'd like to point out that deciding whether and how to treat the emergencies in Ottawa is a legacy issue for this council, whether you run or not for the next term. This is because you are the captain and crew of what is turning out to be the Titanic. And right now you're heading a straight for an iceberg of gigantic proportions. From COP26, we've learned that the ship needs to be thrown in reverse very quickly and change directions to avert a disaster. This is the decision this council has to make and it's urgent and it can't be kicked down the road further. I urge the committee to be bold and to further, further fully fund development of the computer of these projects. We need to get the big public and private energies and investments going. And now I just want to do a bit about the emergency. So the next slide, please. This slide shows you where we're heading now. No change as business as usual and where we need to go at the bottom. So there's a lot of thinking and work that has to happen. Next slide. COP26 shows us that we are going unlikely to reach 1.5. So we're going to have serious climate impacts. Next slide. What does that mean? That means that investments need to start now. Otherwise, we're going to have major damaging and spiral, major damages and spiraling costs. The investments that are predicted are 26.6 billion between 20, 200, 2020 and 2050. This is in one of your technical papers. Next slide. Public is very concerned and wants investment now. You've got a lot of delegations on this. Stewardship and helping us get there is really needed. Next slide. Uh, this is energy evolution funding through 30 million. It's only 55% of what will in turn out to be the total investment. It's really needed and it needs to start now. This is the third budget since the climate change emergency was declared. Next slide. Climate change master plan. I don't know what the budget is for this. I'm assuming it's identified somewhere, but it does need to have targets and timelines in accordance with the uh, plans that you have and also with the wonderful race to zero, which the city signed out leading up to COP. Next slide and final slide. Climate uh, change time. adaptation. Okay, thanks. I'm just guessing we need 2 million. Thank you very much. And uh, I have a lot of confidence in everybody. I just would hope they take this seriously and fund that computer. All right, thanks. Just on your on one of your slides there, that the energy evolution is the funding implementation plan for um, the climate change master plan. That's great. I didn't know that. Thank you, Scott. So we can take that off the list. <laughs> it's not one or the other. It's 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 both together. Uh, okay. Councilor Menard. Thanks very much, uh, Chair. Thank you, Joan. Um, I guess one one question I wanted to ask you is around um, you know the projects and funding for um, resiliency, the resilience action, um, the importance that you're mentioning of of starting now um, and not waiting um, until you know Q2 of 2023, um, which means funding delays until a later year. So I just, I wanted to hear more about um, your own uh, views on, on that and uh, the importance of getting started right away. Um, well, that's great. Thanks for the good question, um, Councillor Menard, um, especially because I raced through that at the very end. <laughs> uh, so um, the climate, the resilience strategy is doing a lot of good work in the resilience team, but they're about two years behind. They've internalized and worked internally with the city. I think we've got about 10 internal working groups going on, three on water. It's great. There's a lot of stuff happening. But as you've heard from delegations now, uh, today, there's a lot of interest in elements of resilience being handled or the people are getting anxious and they want to do things. They want to do stewardship. They want to plant trees. 
I'm hearing neighborhoods that want to figure out how to properly plan their 15 minutes and how do you figure that into the intensification, which is all lots of resilience discussion. Um, so right now it's important, I think, to, to, as I said, galvanize all that interest and support it. Uh, so that's one part of it. And I think also, I think we've heard the climate staff talk about the need to mobilize everybody, create this little army of enthusiastic people. Well, that takes time and we need to get going on it. In addition, there's other resilience activities that are happening right now. The climate uh, coming out of the official plan, there's the need to uh, develop incentives to deal with um, the uh, lack of coverage for of the uh, high performance development standards for a lot of the a lot of the buildings. And so there's a need to to work on that. That's partly resilience and partly mitigation. So there's just project work that needs to get going. We can't wait until um, all of the uh, internal work is done, we, and especially engagement of the public. So that, that's, hey. that's why I'm suggesting starting now. Twin tracks. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Joan, for your time today. OK. Our next speaker is John D. Reed, and then our last speaker will be Cecile Wilson. Mr. Reed, go ahead. Thank you very much. And thank you for the opportunity to speak today and for your work on behalf of the environment. In particular, thank you for promoting the motion passed by council to have Ontario eliminate natural gas in the province's electricity generation system. I'm here as a concerned citizen having earlier this month ended a term as a board member of the Hunt Club Community Association with leadership responsibility for environmental matters. That role was hampered owing to the high cost of insurance. Years ago, I was an atmospheric research scientist and represented Canada in international negotiations on the Montreal Protocol on substances that deplete the ozone layer. As a committee, you have a tough remit when it comes to climate. I'd like to suggest seven things you could do within the budget to advance the chances of the city meeting the national goal to reduce and eliminate greenhouse gases. Number one, have the city report on greenhouse gas emissions in a timely manner. Annual reports are available many months after the end of the period. That makes them largely of historical interest. If interim reports could be issued quarterly using the partial data readily available, so they were timely, that would have greater impact and prompt more action. The present pandemic has shown the effectiveness of short-term reporting. Number two, require the city to issue a greenhouse gas emission budget along with a financial budget. Just as taxes are, thankfully, constrained so is the scope for greenhouse gas emissions. The city should be careful in managing that resources as you are with tax money. Number three, require city departments to only purchase non-fossil fuel vehicles, or if they do, issue a statement explaining the options examined and why a non-fossil fuel vehicle was not an appropriate choice this committee could receive and consider a periodic summary. Number four, require city buildings new and retrofit to use green technologies such as solar panels and heat pumps, preferably ground source heat pumps. Number five, require development applications to include a climate greenhouse gas assessment component the recent proposal to clear cut an area of trees south of Hunt Club Road for a parking and car storage facility made no mention of the loss of carbon sequestration by the healthy trees. Treat areas that provide an environmental service should no longer be termed vacant as they were in that application. Number six, modify regulations regarding trees to recognize that in some limited circumstances, there's a net greenhouse gas benefit to removing trees 
to permit optimal functioning of solar panels. And seven and last, work towards limiting entry of fossil fuel powered vehicles downtown during peak periods. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Reed. appreciate that. Uh, any questions for our delegation? Yes, Councillor Brockington. Thanks, Chair, and thank you, uh, Dr. Reed, for your presentation. Um, just on, uh, thank you for your list. I noted all seven. Uh, number two is the greenhouse gas emission budget line. I don't want to put you on the spot. Are you aware of um, any other Ontario or Canadian municipalities who you could refer me to that do what you're suggesting? Well, I think an earlier presentation referred to Edmonton. Um, that's the only one that, that I'm aware of in Canada. Okay, but the goal would be to say, we have a target. We need to back up our um, target with dedicated funds, and then we need to measure our success um, and return on that investment against the target. That's the intent. The, the intent is basically to say, we can, as a city, emit a certain amount of greenhouse gases, just as within a city, we have a, a tax cap in which we can, we can live within. And so we should be looking at the greenhouse gas budget just as diligently as we look at the tax budget. Fair enough, thank you very much. Thank you. All right, uh, thank you. At the start of your, uh, just going back, at the start of your presentation, you mentioned that you were part of the, was the Hunt Club Community Association, remind me? Yes. And because of the interest, because of the insurance uh, costs, you got you got discarded, or what's what's what did you say there? No, no. I mean, this this is an ongoing situation with uh, with uh, various community associations. No, I'm aware. I just you you, you just yeah, indicated the that your association seemed to to not choose to go on with the. Your, your role in, in environment. Oh, I no, it's, it, it's not my personal role. My leaving the, the community association board was a, a personal decision. I'm oh, okay. okay. To, Sorry, Miss. Uh, but I, I think this is an important issue across many community associations and particularly in, in activities where people have to get out into the environment and do things like clearing uh, noxious weeds, et cetera, invas invasive species. Uh, people want to be sure that in doing that, they're not going to be subjecting themselves to, to liability, uh, which is, is not covered because they are doing that for the benefit of the city. Yeah, no, agreed. All right, thank you, John, appreciate that. And our final uh, delegation today is Cecile Wilson. Ms. Wilson, go ahead. Hi, uh, thanks very much, uh, Councillor, and I want to thank you all for the opportunity to speak before you this morning. I am here as a concerned resident of Ottawa, and I do want to thank you for all the work that you've done to this point to meet the daunting challenges posed by climate destabilization. I'm encouraged to hear the questions and discussions taking place in this committee this morning, and I'm also very happy to hear of Councillor Menard's motion to allocate funds for addressing the climate emergency. I wholeheart wholeheartedly support such an allocation. First, I'd like to acknowledge that we all here on the territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe people. And I also acknowledge that their view that everything and everyone is connected provides a constructive framework for viewing the many issues we face in this city. After reviewing information proof provided to CAFE's members regarding funding available for climate change, I have two concerns. The first is stable funding for energy evolution. And the second is the designation of and funding for a full-time equivalent point person for the city's climate emergency programs. In the first case, in my opinion, the tasks set for energy evolution are significant enough that there must be a steady level of funding provided, and other speakers have already um, spoken about this as well. I do not have the financial knowledge to suggest how this might be done. Uh, Tim, Angela, and Joan have all spoken about this. My contribution, such as it may be, is about perception. It does seem to me that without stable funding, energy evolution will find it hard, if not impossible, to achieve its goals. While in good years, the money, money forwarded from Hydro Ottawa to energy evolution may be sufficient, as we have seen in 2021, a decrease 
in the income coming from Hydro Ottawa means effectively a cut in Energy Evolution's budget. I therefore request that you find a way to provision Energy Evolution with stable funding. My second concern relates to the designation and funding of a full-time equivalent person for the city's climate emergency plans. There's funding for 120 full-time equivalent people in the budget, but none of this is allocated to deal with climate change. In 2019, a number of Ottawa residents and some councillors pressed the full council to declare a climate emergency. Since then, the emergency has only worsened. But if the climate threat does not warrant at least one full-time point person to deal with it, what does this communicate to residents about how much of an emergency the, the city actually thinks this is? We need to communicate to the public that the extreme events we have experienced recently, tornadoes, 100-year floods, extended heat waves, uh, fluctuations in temperatures like this summer, are likely connected to climate destabilization induced by burning fossil fuels. These links need to be made consistently. Extreme weather events have social costs in terms of health, loss of housing, as well as financial costs for both repair and protective actions such as sandbagging. Furthermore, climate change effects are felt across the spectrum. They affect biodiversity, invasive species, as has already been discussed, tree canopy, green spaces, water quality and sewer services, housing and shelter, the need for cooling centers, and transportation and infrastructure, just to name some of them. While I applaud using a climate lens for each service that the city provides, I think it is critical to have a central person to identify, coordinate, and to communicate to the public the connections between the various city departments in terms of climate emergency actions. I know that many more people are concerned about climate destabilization than come here before city committees. The language we use and the examples we set communicate what is important to us. Having a full-time person devoted to dealing with the climate emergency will communicate to residents that this is truly an emergency. I'm originally from BC. I know Vancouver where 600 or more people died from lack of shelter from excessive heat. Lytton, which burned to the ground, Merritt, where everyone has had to evacuate due to a flooded sewer system, and Hope, where two nearby slides stranded 275 motorists. We have witnessed the tremendous social and financial costs that climate destabilization events have incurred. The continued rise of greenhouse ga gases and their lifespan in the atmosphere means things will only get worse here in Ottawa, as elsewhere, unless governments at all levels commit to treating climate destabilization with the seriousness it deserves. Thank you. All right, uh, thank you very much. Any questions for Ms. Wilson? Uh, seeing none, thank you for your time today. Thank you. So with that, we will now go to questions to staff. Um, just a quick one first, the climate resiliency strategy, when do we expect that to come to our committee? Because I know there's a lot of comments today, a lot of questions about, you know, um, other municipalities, what they did, it's interesting, you know, Edmonton was actually behind us on climate emergency. Edmonton was actually behind us on a funding strategy for, for climate initiatives, but we, we often hear, why aren't we doing what Edmonton is doing? Well, um, so just curious if someone can answer that question about when the climate resilience strategy is coming, because I think a lot of the things that people are looking for is in that. Hello, Chair. Seeing no one else jumping in. Um, the climate resiliency strategy is in three parts. The first was the climate projections that Council received in June of 2019. The second is the climate risk and vulnerability assessment, and that is expected to come forward next year. Um, and the third will be the climate resiliency strategy itself. And there were mention of delays associated with that resiliency strategy. And those are really because we've been working with staff across the corporation to align with other key plans, the official plan, associated master plans and asset management plans, so that the work from the climate projections and from the vulnerability and risk assessment is embedded within those. So at this point, we expect the vulnerability and risk assessment to come in this term of council and the climate resiliency strategy to come in the next. Okay. All right. Thank you for that. Um, just a heads up, not sure if they want to come in, but Don Herwire, Scott LaBears, and David Barkley are all over in the uh, the attendees section. I know Steve Willis was just there, but he's finally in here. 
Oh, wait, so we'll go to questions. Uh, first up, Councillor Brockington. Thank you, Chair. I, I have a number of questions. So when you're tired of hearing me, just tell me to stop. Oh, that would be tired. Don't hearing. say it yet. Um, so can staff, I want to talk about the water rate. We get questions throughout the year from residents about the, the water rate that they're paying, concerns about uh, the rate itself, I realize, depending where you live in the city, the rate is different, but uh, we've heard for years the critical infrastructure needs that the city has, that the rate is what it is because it needs to address those critical needs. Can staff just confirm that that's the case, that we are well above the rate of inflation because of the critical state of the water infrastructure? So I can start, Chair, uh, in terms of the rate it is aligned with the Long Range Financial Plan. The Long Range Financial Plan is based on the needs, the infrastructure needs of the city going forward. It's a highly asset intensive service. And in that Long Range Financial Plan, we identified almost more than 50% of the budget goes towards the asset intensive nature of it. And so what we're showing as increases over those 10 years is to meet that need. And there was actually a funding gap we're trying to catch up on over uh, a five year period. So are there critical assets not being addressed in the 2022 budget? Could somebody from infrastructure services answer the question? Chair, the, the water is in, um, in fair to good condition. Uh, so we can say that no critical infrastructure is not being addressed. We are catching up, uh, but we are having a good level of investments uh, to make sure that our uh, water services uh, continue to provide uh, good quality and um, support to our residents. Okay, this is a question I ask every year because we have a legal responsibility as elected members to ensure that we are not putting the people's drinking water at risk and that if we are aware of uh, infrastructure that is in a critical state that we ensure we, uh, we allocate required resources to that function. So you're saying that the 2022 budget does capture any and all infrastructure that may be in a critical state and we're not leaving any infrastructure behind that's in that state. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay, excellent, thank you. Um, fire hydrant maintenance and uh, it sounds like a low hanging item, but uh, aesthetics are important in communities. Can someone tell me how fire hydrants are maintained on an annual basis, which includes painting them. Chair, I'm not sure we have the right person from Public Works and, uh, on the call today. So if the councillor will allow, we can take that question offline and get them a response because I don't believe we have the right people on the line today. Yep. That's fine. I appreciate that. Thank you. You're, you're uh, Chair. No. Just... Sorry about that. Go ahead, Kevin. Sorry. I, yeah. Our distribution, water distribution staff do maintain hydrants, including painting, including valve exercising, including condition assessment, assessments each year. If the council wants more details on specific locations, we're certainly able to get that to them. I don't want to take up the committee's time. There are fire hydrants in my ward that have more rust than mm -hmm. paint. And so I want to know what the mechanism is on an annual basis. If you're going to test the hydrant for flow, who is noting that the hydrant is in the, the state that it is? But if I can park that now, uh, Kevin, that would be great. Um, page 10 of the water budget, there's a line, sanitary sewer uh, agreement revision fee. $118 in 2020, $120 in 2021, $367 in 
in 2022. What exactly does this fee cover and why is there such a uh, high increase in 2022? Councillor, can you please repeat the reference to the page and fee, please? Yes, page 10 of the water budget, and it's second last row, sanitary <laughs> sewer agreement revision fee. Thanks, Chair, um, I think the fees were reviewed as a part of the sewer use bylaw. Just, you got, uh, you've got two mics on. Sorry so what's that going? There you go, it's better. So they were reviewed as part of the sewer use bylaw. Okay, but I'm they asking what is it? Cost of the program, my apologies. Okay, so can I park this question? I, I don't understand the answer, but again, I don't wanna take up the committee's time. It's 211% increase. I wanna know how many households may be impacted by this. I wanna know why it's increasing at the rate, the percentage increase it is. But again, I'm trying to get my head around. I can follow up with an email if that's easiest. Yeah, I, I will follow up directly with you, Councillor. Okay. Just that one applies more commercially, does it not? That, uh, that sewer use fee applies more to commercial entities? You're correct. Okay, two more uh, questions. One is the uh, Carlton Carlington Heights water reservoir replacement. This has been on the books for years. I think Councillor Shirelli and I had a public meeting five years ago on this. It keeps getting delayed. This is the largest reservoir in the city. Um, I see it in the budget. Uh, when is this actually gonna start construction? To you, Chair. Uh, the calling the pumping station uh, work it is in the final stages of design. Uh, you may recall that we needed to uh, make some adjustments uh, to the design that we were working on and the project was park. Um, it is going for construction uh, in 2022 and we are in the middle of doing a pre-selection of the contractor. So uh, while we are completing the design, we are pre-selecting the, con the contractors that are going to bid on this project. So you feel fairly confident this project will begin next year? Based on all the information I have, yes. Okay. Um, finally, Mr. Chair, as far as my set of questions, um, the garbage solid waste user fees, staff referenced this in their presentation. For single family households, it's proposed that the fee go from $106 to $118. I'm looking at the multi-residential household fee, which is the row right below this. 2021, it's $71.50, and the proposal for next year is $77.50. So my question to staff is, is why are single family households being hit with a larger rate increase than multi residential households? Thank you for the question, uh, Chair. Uh, so, Councillor, there are two separate contracts. So, we have the, the curbside contract, which basically uh, was awarded in 2019. So, the curbside costs are going up in order to reflect that the cost, the true cost of that contract. And the multi-residential -residen contract, which was a separate contract awarded also in 2019. So the, the costs for the multi-residential sector are based on that contract to serve the multi-residential properties. So the fees are just based on the cost of the contracts, two different contracts. Are staff able to try and blend those rates more closely together or do we have to have a rate that matches cost? So, Chair, the, the type of service delivery that that's offered. So with the multi-res, it, it is a, a different, it's a containerized system uh, re requiring different vehicles. Uh, so it is a, it, it is a separate contract in, in its own. Um, so I, I think we, we are being uh, transparent and fair to the property owners by aligning the, the true cost for the service delivery that they are receiving. Yeah, I, I want to wrap my head around this more because I do think we need to think about lowering the uh, single family household fee. Uh, certainly when folks get their tax bills, this is something they raise. 
I do want people to be aware of, of waste in general and, and the costs, both financial and environmental to waste. So I don't want to, to skirt that issue, but I just want to note on the record that I hear uh, from my residents as well in this. So that's something I'm concerned about. Finally, Chair, I'll just say, um, we heard at the beginning of the meeting that Councillor Menard may be putting a motion on the floor. I do want to speak to that motion. I'm going to yield the floor at this time and perhaps come back just for a minute or two to speak to that motion once it's uh, once it's tabled. So thank you. No worries. Um, just on the on the garbage collection fee, it is tied directly to those contracts. So the cost of the contracting is what is what built into the, the when we. When we in 2012 moved from you know weekly to bi-weekly garbage collection, it resulted in a reduced contract value because we weren't sending trucks out as much. Now they were covering more miles because they fill up faster. Uh, the, but we had less trucks going on the roads, so it allowed us to reduce the contract. But actually reduced the garbage collection rate by about ten dollars at that time. But as costs have gone up on the collection contract, those costs have gone back to the collection fee. So it's 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 a very defined user fee it's right. and it's if you if you lower it you're merely subsidizing from somewhere else so we're just we have to shift it to somewhere else buried in the budget which is kind of what previous councils did when they funded the green bin project by uh by sticking it in in the actual budget rather than having it on that garbage collection rate fair enough thank you for that context no worries um councillor flurry Thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and thank you, uh, Councillor Brockington. I, I too had flagged uh, that particular issue, but on, on the same budget segment, so on the solid waste group, could we understand a bit the difference of the uh, close to 6.9 million in, in change of revenue? What, what's driving that change? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, through your chair. Thank you for the question, Councillor. Uh, so the, the change in, in revenue is the, the cost um, through the, the, the markets uh, for, the, uh, for the sale, the resale of our recycling products. Um, I think uh, through previous uh, uh, conversations and presentations, uh, we, we have uh, highlighted the fact that the, the quality of the material that the, the residents uh, put at the end of their, their driveway is, is quite clean and we do then benefit uh, greatly. And, and right now the markets are, are quite high. So um, that, that is part in part the, the, the change in the, the revenue. Okay. If I could also add 4.3 million is in, of that amount is the increase in the fee, the garbage fee. Okay, thanks for uh, thanks for clarifying. And and when you're saying garbage fee, it refers right back to Riley's question around the the single households. Is that correct? And multi res, yes. And multi res, okay. Um, a little higher in the budget on page seven, we're we talk about um, uh, public spaces, waste, and, and recycling. And, and more specifically, I, I wanted to understand last year we um, piloted, I believe. I, in want, I don't want to cut you off. If you can, when you're talking about pages in the budget book, if you can just reference whether it's the oh, tax, it's tax. budget or rates, it would be easier for staff. Yeah. yeah, sorry about that. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I'm looking to understand. Um, what is the stat in this year's budget? What is the status of last year's pilot for parks? I believe each ward had a pilot for uh, three stream recycling uh, in our parks. And I'm just looking for clarification as to where we're at with that pilot and, and what's, uh, what's reflected in this year's budget. Uh, thank you for the question. So uh, we will be maintaining the, the pilot that was initiated in 2021 through 2022. So as part of the capital ask, uh, we are seeking funds to support the, the resources in order to continue with the collection in the 33 parks, that's including one destination park. Um, that'll give us time to understand better what is happening with IPR, as well as further advances of the solid waste master plan. So that way we're able to come back to you for the 2023 budget with a, uh, an approach for how we're going to deal with our uh, three stream program that we currently have in parks. 
Okay, so we'll have a plan ahead of the 23 budget as to what that future contract would look like? Yes. Okay, can I clarify? I thought the parks waste was done through city. Is that not, is that not accurate? Uh, so hopefully I understand correctly, uh, Chair, that the question. And so based on talking about the parks pilot, the three stream program that the city uh, initiated a number of years ago, which we have uh, kept uh, enhancing um, as, as we've moved forward. Okay. And for the regular waste disposal in, in parks um, through our single stream, uh, th that is something, yes, that, that is a, a, a city service that's offered. So can I understand a bit clearer? So if we were, so there is a capital cost to purchasing the recycling elements, uh, but we're picking it up. So there's, uh, assuming we're picking up the same volume, just in different streams, the only cost would be capital. Is that, am I wrong in that assumption? So with the, the, the pilot uh, project, we are collecting those three streams uh, separately, whereas our, our regular uh, of the 900 additional parks that we have across the city, um, those are, are single streams and, and basically they're not, uh, we're not leveraging the uh, recycling or, uh, or the air through, through those programs. So sorry, Council, I may not have understood your question. Well, I just want to understand it, like the actual pressure is a capital only because we're we're already in those parks picking up waste. So it's just about the, the having the bin and the stream available, no? That, that's right. And so basically the, the funding that's part of the 2022 budget is for the resourcing in order to use different vehicles because we are uh, streaming each of those um, three streams individually in order to uh, bring them for the recycling versus the, the waste. Okay. I'd like to take that offline with you, maybe just to understand it a bit better. Um, on, on the, <laughs> on the rate segment, uh, I'm, I have a question on page 51, which is in relation to the lead pipe replacement. And I want to understand, um, I was under the impression that the city had no lead pipes based on the size of the pipe pipes that we owned. I'm looking for just a clarification uh, of that. Sure, thank you for the question. Uh, Councillor, the, sorry, I have to. Uh, thank you for the question and sorry about the feedback. Um, for, there are no water distribution pipes that are lead. Uh, the funding is for lead water services from the water distribution pipe. Uh, to the home, the city owns a portion of those services. And and that reflect the, the budget element to that reflects previous years, or that's the total remaining. Or can you give me a bit of? Can you give us a little more as to what that figure uh, means? Great. What that budget figure means? Great question. Um, we've got uh, five hundred thousand dollars allocated in this budget, plus um, plus some existing authority from the previous two years, where construction uh, was difficult uh, and and slow uh, due to COVID. Um, so the the existing authority plus the five hundred thousand sets us up in a good position uh, to manage the expected uptake. Um, if you recall earlier this year. Uh, the city distributed uh, letters to homeowners with um, based on the age of property uh, with suspected uh, lead pipes. Um, and we, uh, we typically uh, complete 75 renewals in a year at $13,000 a piece. Um, the, the existing budget in this envelope allows for us to do three times uh, that uh, this year. And that's what we're expecting based on uh, uptake numbers uh, that from from the letter mailer. So the, re, the 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 money is the rebates as part of the lead pipe replacement program, correct? Precisely. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Yeah. No, I appreciate appreciate that. Um, if if someone were to come to us and the budget was not remaining, we would how would we deal with that? Would we see that as a deficit condition, or we would rely on future year funding, like? 
if, if we get to zero, um, zero left in that account? Yeah, again, Councillor, we're, we're budgeted to complete them three times uh, the average annual. Uh, I, I anticipate that we'll have uh, enough uh, budget authority for this year. If we do exceed, we would move those to, uh, to, to next year's uh, construction program. Okay, okay. My final question, Mr. Chair, is when you look at the budget, that continued segment further down, I believe it's on page 110, there's a number of reference to ROPEC. And I, I'm going back to Councillor Brockington's point around maintaining good infrastructure. And, and I, when I look at ROPEC, there's a number of spending, like a, just to give you one here, 910131 is 3 million, 910535 is 15 million. And, and the total sum is around 27 million for ROPEC. I, I, I hope that we're doing the right thing, but at what point are we, um, is there an oversight of what is needed uh, or that investment plan for such important facilities? I mean, we have others for Britannia, the New Island and so on. I'm just looking for clarity. There's obviously important spending here, but just, um, just to, to better understand how those were allocated. And if there is a, a, a not a wrap up, but a, 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 a summary of those spending for, for these facilities. Perhaps I can start. Um, there is a large amount of work that's happening at same. ROPEC. Oh, you're fine. It was the same thing, but it's, it's been solved. Now the other one's on. Oh, there we go. Sorry, there's a, there is a master plan for works at the at the ROPEC, uh, the sewage treatment plant. The plant is uh, was built in the early 90s or actually upgraded in the 90s. So a lot of retrofit work has to be done on that plant to bring it um, you know, to renew facilities, but the plant is in great shape. And so that's really the spending plan is for all of those works that just have to bring that facility up to shape. Maybe Karina can add anything to that. Chair. So some of the projects that are on the list uh, would be the raw sewage pumping station motors, drives and pumps. Um, electrical master plan projects, capitalized maintenance, screen and degrit. Um, and we also have some, some money that is kept there um, for unplanned works, which is normal for most of our infrastructure. Okay, okay and I, I guess for, for good stewards, I think going back to, Riley, to Riley's earlier point, like just a broader understanding of, hey, facility is this old, here's the amount of money we're going to need to spend over the next five years to upkeep it. Like, I wonder how that is reported out because in these budget items, it's hard to challenge that or, or to even get a full picture of uh, that spending plan. And I'd, I, I'd love for clarification. Chair, so a couple of things are happening. So first off, we're formalizing our water facilities asset management. Um, there's an ongoing program to really formalize and establish that and better align our asset management practices with the asset management that is done with other uh, linear infrastructure. So that is well underway. And we also um, are working on the asset management plans for the core infrastructure, which we'll be coming back to council with, sorry, committees and council with in 2022. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Councillor Cloutier. Thank you, Chair. Um, merci. Uh, and with respect to um, rate supported budget <clears throat> and picking up uh, on the questions by Councillor Brockington et, et le Conseil Fleury, um, just at, at a little bit higher level, we are a certain number of years into a, an effort, a plan to close that gap. Uh, and Ms. Jasmine had referred to that gap with increases, as Councillor Brockington had said, that are higher than inflation, I think currently around five or 6%, as opposed to the, the, um, the cost of living. Perhaps the question is to Ms. Jasmine, where are we in that plan with respect to, and 
road pack and some pipes in the ground that need to be updated because they weren't maintained. Not that they weren't maintained properly, but the gap needs to be closed. Where are we in that overarching plan to close that gap? Ms. Jackson. So, uh, yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So in terms of the rate, uh, long range financial plan uh, is it was also a 10 year plan, but that one we wanted to close the gap within five years. And then in the next five years, continue on that trajectory to make up for the backlog that would have been created in the first five. So uh, I want to clarify it's a funding gap not an infrastructure gap. And each year we weren't funding sufficiently, so we needed to catch up the base. So in five years, it started in 2018. So we are actually catching up and our funding at the, what we expected when we did the LRFP in 2017, we are now funding in 2022 at the level we were expecting in the LRFP. So we are aligned with the LRFP. We've addressed the gap by 2022, but now we have to uh, continue on in the same trajectory to make up for the backlog in the past five years. Okay, so thank you for that. And, and I know that staff maintain our, our uh, water systems uh, um, to, to a, a world-class standard and I, I've, I appreciate it. And Councilor Brockington uh, alluded to that. Um, but it, it is a funding gap. And from our residents' point of view that they get on their water bills, they, and, and the questions that we get is, as councillors, when will, the, the increases be more in line with um, the rate of inflation. And, and again, I recognize that it's an asset intensive um, system. So you're saying that now we're going to have to catch up on the infrastructure that was perhaps delayed a little bit because we were closing a gap previously. Do you have any um, insight, any vision as to when that gap we will be at a stable state if I could in terms of funding so on the rate side we are at at the amount that we had put aside said we needed put aside annually so in 2022 we are caught up uh, we have addressed the funding gap uh, now uh, there will be another long-range financial plan and with each long-range financial plan we reassess our assets we reassess what our needs are, and then we come up with the funding strategy for the next 10 years. And so it's, it's an ongoing planning we're... cycle. And that's with the next uh, infrastructure master plan, um, which is in 2024. We will have a companion report, which is the update to the, ta uh, to the rate long range financial plan. Okay, thank you for that. What the other person who was speaking, and I, I apologize, I didn't get that person's name, said that formalized asset management for ROPEC and, and things like that, we get a 2022 update. You're saying 2024, is it two different processes? Jen, did you wanna explain the difference between the two years? Yes, so thank you for the question, Chair. Um, so the asset management legislation that's provincially mandated requires that we bring the first asset management plans for what they describe as core infrastructure, which is transportation, water, wastewater, and stormwater by July 1st of 2022. So that is why we're driving for those timelines for the first round of asset management plans. I see. Okay, thank you for that. Another question with still with respect to the rate supported. Uh, slide eight or slide nine uh, spoke about an increase of 800,000 cubic meters. What is that in terms of percentage or consumption? And my real, let me get to my real question. Is it because of population growth? Is it per capita consumption going up? And my other question is that, that you can uh, reflect on, the new rate structure that we passed several years ago to cover fixed costs, and again, it is an asset intensive system. What is the context of how that changed rate structure impacted um, consumption? I recognize that it reflected the cost structure as an accountant, I, I, I respect that, I understand that. But how did those decisions impact consumption? Does anyone have any context in that?
So I, I can speak generally. Uh, we have maintained uh, the same level of consumption in all our budgeting for the last, I'd say since the last long range financial plan, it's been fairly steady state. And we were waiting to see if there was a general trend of increase. And, I, I, and I'm not an expert in water consumption. So I'm assuming a lot of it is related to growth. Um, we, we wanted to make sure we weren't taking into, uh, into consideration any impact of the pandemic because a lot of consumption has shifted to residential during the pandemic we just see a general trend and and uh, when we budget we want to make sure we're um, at least showing what we think the volumes will be because that's how we estimate our revenues going forward sure no, so that was a general trend yeah i'll just step in if that's okay isabel uh counselor and a great question actually and great observation um this has to do with the growth that's happening in our city so as isabel said we've used the same uh cubic meter consumption for um, multiple budget cycles. And so now what we're seeing is there's growth. And so we have then um, increased uh, the cubic meters that are going to be consumed, which, and what that does is it actually pushes those rates down just very slightly as a result. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that on, uh, on the rate supported. Um, with respect to the tax supported um, budget and the delegations we heard to staff, and again, I appreciate the indulgence of the chair and I'll, I'll, be, I'll be quick. Uh, what are the most invasive species that need to be controlled or eradicated? Does, does anybody in forestry or parks know? That'd be more of a natural systems question. I don't know if- uh, Nick's Is it? Hosts. Okay. Yeah. I, don't, I, don't, I don't know if Nick's on the line, so- I'll There is. Dr. Stowe. Nick got a haircut. I did indeed, Councillor. I'm sorry, Councillor Spichay. Could you repeat the message, please? Uh, of course. Repeat thank you. Question. Thank you, Dr. Stowe. It's nice to see you. What are the Good most invasive species, if, if we're to at some point fund pilot or something, what are the species that need to be controlled or eradicated? Um, well, we would need to distinguish between those that we can control and eradicate and those that we cannot. So there are some species that are so well established in, uh, in the city that we will never entirely eradicate them. Um, buckthorn is one of those species. The most that we will ever be able to accomplish is to manage it in, um, in some areas of the city, in some public parks, in some natural areas. Um, but it's also well established in the rural area where we will never be able to, to eliminate it. Um, so buckthorn is, is that way. Um, uh, gar uh, um, garlic mustard is another one we'll probably never eradicate. So we need to focus on those that we can control and we need to identify where we can do that. And of course, the issue there uh, as has been discussed is, is resourcing. Okay, thank you. That's valuable because as we're discussing with community associations, you know, we've also heard, and if you could just nod or dog strangling vine, and, and we do have a program for wild parsnip. Would you consider another one that would be a something that can be discussed in our communities? Dog strangling but, vine. Dog strangling vine is is um, is one of the the most pervasive species. Japanese knotweed is becoming um, an issue in some in some areas, and one that uh, we probably still have the capacity to manage effectively. Um, and the, the invasive um, uh, Phragmites. So we have a non, we have a native species of Phragmites, and then a non-native species. Phragmites is a um, a reed that occurs in wetlands. Um, the invasive species again is starting to become established in Ottawa, and we may still have the ability to do some some management of it. Um, although that that would be within wetlands, which requires some special equipment and special skills. Okay, thank you. You know, important to deal with these before they get a, a foothold. Um, on to budget. Um, the Urban Forest Management Plan, um, page 118, talks about using volunteers to remove invasives and uh, examples of grants with communities. And page 120 talks about community associations having stewardship. And there's a recommendation, recommendation 22, that is a provision for a staff position. And I believe it's in this budget for outreach and education and stewardship and partnership with, with community groups. Um, 
is there a possibility of this position being used to deal with some of the issues that we've heard from from, uh, from community associations and, and from councillors with respect to engaging with volunteers, um, training leaders, training volunteers, removal of those so that we can uh, move forward in managing, controlling the invasive species that we have in some of our public areas and parks. So Chair, if, if, I, if I may begin on answering this and Nick and Martha may assist me in this. The new position that's proposed as part of PIDE's budget uh, is actually to do two things. The first area which has not been discussed is continuing our work on uh, managing tree issues and in infill development projects, primarily committee of adjustment type applications. And uh, it hasn't been discussed today, but I can tell you, I think I have deal with a counselor a week uh, on issues related to trees and infill applications. So that's the primary purpose of the job. But by having additional staff resources, it will give us a bit more bandwidth to assist in the in some of the other projects in the Urban Forest Management Master Plan that uh, Martha and Nick have been working on. Uh, but I wanna have realistic expectations that the primary role is really assisted in, in the application review, but additional resources will allow us to do a bit more. Okay, thank you. And, and, and I will just add uh, through you, Mr. Chair, the um, in addition to the planning forester position that Mr. Willis was speaking about, forestry services is getting a stewardship position. And I think uh, my colleague, Martha Copestake, and uh, my other colleague, uh, Tracy Schwetz, could speak to that better. Thanks so much, Nick and Steve and Councillor Cloutier through you, Chair. Um, so yes, we do have that, uh, the, this budget does include that new stewardship position and it's an urban forest focused stewardship position. And it's as per that recommendation that you refer to in the urban forest management plan. So the request for urban forest stewardships have been, has been great over the last few years and specifically as we've been coming through the pandemic. And we've got a lot on deck for this new person to do. So the first step is gonna be basically recommendation 23, the next one in the UFMP, which is to um, develop an outreach and engagement strategy. And so through the development of that, we're going to be looking at all of the interests that we've seen and that we've identified and how best to address them. So we have a, a bunch of stuff on deck for that. Generally, this new position won't have the capacity to fully cover coordination of stewardship um, in natural areas in this invasive species management, but we think that it can play a small role in that. But, um, you know, to the information that you've got coming forward in your inquiry, we think that um, <clears throat> doing the kind of work that's been discussed today does involve partnerships with multiple groups at the city and um, urban forests are a part of that. So forestry would be a part of those discussions, but there's also you know, open spaces, green spaces, roadsides, parks, wetlands, as, as Nick just said. So these groups need to gather together to basically work out the best way to deliver a program such as what was has been discussed um, at length today. So um, staff is recognize the incredible value of these kind of stewardship positions and and um, and the role that they can play and we're 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 very excited to have somebody focused on the the urban forest side of it and to then to start these discussions on um, how the invasive side of it can uh, can work as well. Thank you. Thank you for that. And, and thank you, thank you, thank you to you, to Dr. Stowe, to everybody in forestry, Tracy, and, and for all the work you do on on our green spaces and, and forestry and wetlands and th this issue of invasive species. Just two more questions. Can you tell me anyone, uh, are there any programs in place for dealing with invasive species and specifically, I, I, other than wild parsnip, specifically through a volunteer effort? Are there any programs in the city that you could point me to? Um, through you, Chair, I think that we'll pass this one over to the, the Public Works Group, Allison um, Downs or Tracy Schwetz, I, I think would, would answer this one. Hi, Allison, thanks. Hi, thank you, Martha and Nick. Um, thank you, Chair. We don't have any uh, specific programs other than wild parsnip, parsnip as you mentioned, um, but we do do some um, maintenance with respect to giant hogweed and poison ivy as it comes we become aware of it through uh, maintenance or operations or service requests um yeah 
and and okay. we also would address some uh, issues through planting programs. We really just try to address in a in a small way through our plant planting programs that we have. Tracy, did you have anything to add? Yeah. So, um, thank you for the question. We do address buckthorn on a small scale through, as, as Allison said, through our planting program. So if we're doing a community planting project, for example, and there's some small uh, patches of buckthorn, we, we have worked with community groups in the past to remove those. It's very labor intensive, but um, we don't have any large um, scale buckthorn removal happening and replanting of those natural areas. Okay, thank you, Ms. Schwetz and Ms. Downs. And just my final question, <clears throat> can you give us your perspective as, as we try to move forward to, to advance this, this issue and the ultimate removal or control of those invasive species? Can, can you speak to us about the challenges um, within your departments, how they're currently structured, forestry, parks, uh, public works, to, to develop a program to allow for a kind of volunteer initiatives. Um, the plants are with forestry, the land is operated by parks, corporate real estate is involved. Can you give us any guidance on how any changes that might be made structurally, um, departmentally to move this ahead? Yeah, I, I can take that question, thank you. It, it really will be a consolidated effort between um, different services at the city. Right now, um, we understand there's frustration with community groups who want to help and, and it's all great work that they want to do. There's no, um, there's no formal program or guidelines, best practices, how to navigate through that system for um, you know, consent to enter permits. Um, it, it will require uh, beyond just forestry, of um, a program where people understand how to participate, know what the guidelines are, understand the resources that are available to them. Thank you. Thank you all for your questions. And again, Chair, I appreciate your leniency in my questions. Thank you. No worries. All right, Councillor King. Uh, thank you, Chair. And um, I just wanted to really uh, thank uh, Councillor Brockington, uh, uh, Councillor Fleury and also Councillor uh, Cluche for um, asking questions around reporting out on uh, ROPEC investments. I wanted to ask the same types of, of questions. And so I, I'm pretty reassured that if we are going to get some information um, in terms of uh, uh, financial uh, gaps being closed in asset management plans and in long range of financial plans that will be extremely beneficial uh, for um, providing insight uh, to this committee and council. In the same vein around reporting out, uh, we did have um, a resident, uh, Tim Lash, ask about um, the idea of uh, different types of reporting. So not just uh, financial reporting, but also uh, um, reporting based on uh, carbon. And I was just curious uh, whether staff can speak to this, uh, maybe not in uh, this specific budget, but on a go forward basis, uh, the potential of, of having um, information around uh, planned expenditures by climate activities and GHG targets uh, integrated into uh, future environmental reports in, in future budgets. So Chair, just in response to that question, uh, we had been looking at setting up a pilot project inside uh, two departments of the city or two groups of the city to do carbon budgeting, which is what was referenced in, in the Edmonton example. Uh, our Department of Planning, Infrastructure, Economic Development, and Ottawa Public Health were going to be the two groups that did the pilot of trying that out to see how it would work and roll out uh, corporate-wide. The pandemic hit, Ottawa Public Health's resources were uh, understandably devoted to other priorities. So we parked that, that, that project and we'll resume it again. We'll probably look towards next year to try to resume it again, but we had a good reason why uh, it was delayed. And we are talking to a few other departments about uh, trying out the pilot as well. It's complicated to do it on an organization-wide basis. So we want to get the bugs out with a smaller group and then see how it would roll out on a larger basis. 
No, I appreciate that answer. I think that um, we know that um, it's important to uh, see where the dollars are going. And if we are uh, also uh, uh, really seeing impact uh, in terms of uh, GHG emissions. So I'm, I'm very pleased that we're going to continue on that path. I have uh, two questions, I guess one rate supported and one tax supported. And I'll start with the tax supported uh, item first. So I think it's on page 27, and it uh, refers to uh, the LDD uh, uh, moth motion that I brought forward uh, a while back, uh, $125,000, I believe, is being allocated in this budget. I do appreciate the fact that staff has noted that um, you know a full reporting will come back um, in uh, next year around uh, this initiative, but I was just wondering on a preliminary basis if staff could uh, provide some input on um, how they're envisioning some of this spending, some of this allocation being spent. Thank you, Chair. The, um, the 125 uh, in the budget is for the um, position, the temporary position for a stewardship person who will initially support the um, implementation of the community mitigation programs for LDD moth. So first off, we've, we've already begun to uh, develop those response plans for the spring, um, but we'll be working with, um, you know, we're exploring ideas like burlap distribution programs to the community groups. We're also looking at um, you know, egg mass scraping demonstrations. Um, we are working with, um, on communication, so updates to our website, social media, um, for at, at each stage of the life cycle of the insect. We'll be doing egg mass surveys this uh, starting this month, so that we will, in when we report back or early next year, we'll have a better idea of where the insect will be, where the, those hot spots will be in the city. So all of those pieces will come together in a response plan that will. Um, provide that framework um, to committee in Q1 2022. I appreciate that preview. We have a lot of residents who uh, had been concerned uh, over the last season uh, with uh, the state of the moths and the state of the trees. And so I, I, I think that they will be pleased that uh, there is some action that's going to be taken. Uh, my last question concerns rate, and it is uh, stormwater services. I believe it's on page uh, 71, and it has more to do uh, with uh, the projections. Of course, we're all uh, concerned about the implementation of uh, flood mitigation measures, and I've noticed uh, a large jump uh, in terms of uh, projected uh, uh, spending plans uh, from uh, 2023 to 2024. So I was just wondering if staff uh, could uh, talk to the, the work that will be uh, potentially undertaken um, in the future that would uh, precipitate that, that jump of expenditure. Chair, we need to um, we need to locate the information. Uh, we know exactly what the question is, so if uh, we can follow up uh, after, or we can come back um, during this meeting, um, whatever is your preference. Uh, you can uh, follow up with me uh, personally. Just uh, curious about the jump. I think obviously the spending is warranted. Um, based on the, the amount of, uh, you know, 100 year flooding that we've seen at the city happen in short, uh, you know, uh, concurrency. So it's important, uh, but I just wanted to get a sense of, of what that spending uh, would look like. So I'd appreciate a personal follow up. And those are all my questions. Thank you, Chair. It's the Convent Glen North Storm Sewer. It's project number 908618. Okay. If that helps. That does, I appreciate that. All right, no problem. Uh, thank you, and now we go to, actually, yeah, just, just from Councillor King's point, uh, he was talking about that uh, conversation we had on moths earlier at uh, committee. It's a good example that the budget process is far more than just what we do right here in November every year, and that extends well beyond that timeline. And it's more of an annual process because that conversation that we had at, at our committee in June has now led into an item being right here before us in the budget. So it's it's important to note, and I thank you for flagging that. 
Uh, Councillor Menard is up next. Thanks very much. Glad to hear about that work uh, on the moss. Definitely a problem with uh, some of my parks in my neighborhood as well. Um, I just, before I go into uh, the motion that I put forward, which has been circulated to everybody, and I'll, I'll read it out at the right time, Chair, but I just wanted to talk about the uh, the water rates. And I've got my water bill here, and I just, I just, I've been looking at it, and the I just wanted to go through a few things because it's changed a lot over the years, the last few years. And it's, it's, it's more so about the, the, the consumption versus fixed charges and our own incentive here to reduce water consumption. So um, my water bill has gone up a lot. <laughs> it's gone up. I think it's doubled um, for me anyway, personally in, in uh, less than four years, it's, it seems to have doubled. I go back and I check my financial records it's about that, but, it's not, I'm not so concerned about that because we have to, water is an important resource. It costs a lot to renew it. We need to make sure we're getting it right when we're renewing the infrastructure. And over time, uh, this is comparable to other municipalities. So it's not the overall cost that is concerning me, but the concern is more the, um, the incentive to save. So my incentive to save water has been reduced drastically in the last little while. I really like to conserve because I just want to conserve water. It, it makes sense for me to do that, but there's no financial incentive there as much as there used to be. We do have a tiered based system on the consumption side, but chair, the, the fixed costs have gone up so much more um, than the consumption charges have in recent years. Uh, but on the consumption side, the tiering we use, the tier one, the tier two, the tier three and tier four, um, isn't giving enough for individual families. So I'm not talking about the big players, it's the individual families to save or, or you know, individuals in apartments, people on their own, doesn't whatever it is, a smaller homes doesn't give them enough incentive to save on the tiering, uh, on the consumption-based charges. So I, I just, I, I'm hoping we can get more from city staff. I've raised this in the past, uh, about about that, it, it, how can we get more incentive to, for people to reduce their water congestion so that they can also save financially? Because right now, with the way the fixed rates have gone, have changed, and our consumption tiering, there is very little incentive to save uh, for for water. So I'm not sure if someone can answer that. So, Chair, I could just speak to the original intent. Uh, the fixed charge was intended to show the minimum amount required just to get water to the home um, and it only represents 20% of the overall budget. So 20% comes in as a fixed charge for the city, 80% of our revenue for delivering water and wastewater services is based on the volumetric charge. And the volumetric charge was actually tiered to get some of those high consumption um, um, consumers of properties uh, to uh, reduce. And so, conservation is mostly at that higher tier level. Uh, we did add um, a lifeline rate, which is that first tier, which is half of the next rate. So at least the first uh, six cubic meters are half the rate. Uh, but um, those that are below the average consumption um, probably saw more of an impact on the fixed charge because previously when they were paying for volumetric, they weren't paying enough just to get the service into their home. So that that was the, the most significant impact was that fixed charge just to get the minimum uh, service to the home. Yeah, and I can appreciate that because, you know, I look at my bill here, it's $118 for two months and the fixed charge on it is $72, I think, for, for your larger, or sorry, if you're smaller families, your individuals, that sort of thing, we're a family of four, but for individuals, um, uh, they saw their fixed charges go up as a much larger percentage than their total, total bill. Um, and whereas bigger players, um, those, those consumption charges may have been, uh, larger, um, uh, because certainly mine's not like an 80, 20 split. And so I guess the impetus is, can we look at those consumption charges over time to better tier it so that your smaller, uh, homes, individual families, individual people are, have more incentive to save at that consumption level. Uh, that that would be the the question. I, I recognize the first tier, the zero to six. Um, you're doing very well if you're using less than six cubic meters a month. Um, but that's the that would be it's that second tier and that third tier that I think would be helpful 
for, for families who have had to take on a lot more water costs in the last little while. Um, and that would, would uh, I think, have more incentive to save um, looking at those, those different fixed versus consumption charges. So I just hope it can be reviewed. It was reviewed not too long ago. This change was made not too long ago. Uh, but, but I just hope that we can review on the, the what, what does it do as an incentive to save for individuals? And if we're not there, if we're not getting that incentive to save, then we're, we need to do a better job of getting incentive to save for people um, to reduce their water consumption. So I'll, I'll, I'll take it offline with you. I've raised it before, but I'll take it offline and uh, we could talk more about it there. Thanks. Uh, just very just much. On, that, on that initial review and why, because prior to 2016, when we did the, the stormwater, the, sorry, the, the water sewer and stormwater um, structure review, it was 100% funded by consumption. So the challenge we had was that people would would reduce consumption and yet we would then lose money. So we'd have to jack the rates up you know, between nine and 12% every single year. And everyone kept on saying, I'm getting penalized for reducing my consumption. So we implemented a rate structure that created a bit more of a, a standard rate on, on that, that delivery to the home piece. So almost like a delivery charge. And then, and then built it up from there so that there'd be a bit more. Now, at the start of that situation, you're going to get the, the lower, the lower water users are going to have a bigger bump. But if you take the two rate structures we had, the pre-2016 and the post-2016, and you run them over a chart over the course of the next 10 to 15 years, they would have been paying much more under the old structure 10 years from now than they will under the new structure. It's just that that initial bump up is what is the the biggest hit to them. And that's, that's been the tough part, I think, for, for many of the low, the low volume users. Yeah. Uh, point well taken uh, chair. I think we can do some more work on the consumption side of that formula on the tiering, uh, which, which exists now and uh, work within the same logic you're using uh, on that consumption tier, tiering side to get some more uh, incentive for saving. So take your point though, about uh, the change in, in, in the fix coming in. So appreciate it. Did you want to put your motion for now? Yes, I will. I would like to do that. Thank you. So, uh, Chris, if you can just get that up on the screen, it would be appreciated. You probably don't um, need to read the full two-page preamble. No, I don't. I don't think I will read the whereas clauses. There, there are a lot there. I mean, there. Some of them are extremely important. Um, just given where we've we've been, um, I, I think it's important, committee, just to say in replace with some of these whereas clauses. This is the largest threat facing Ottawa. There's no bigger threat than climate change to our city. Um, and we are on a course where we're going to have to start to um, fund the very good plan that we've put together so that that, that, that comes back to us over time. Uh, the only way we get the savings on the other end is, is if we actually start to invest in it to achieve those savings because you're not going to get there otherwise you're just going to increase your costs more and more to do this as we go along and so the delegations that spoke to us today mostly they were speaking about you know uh climate change uh invasive species things related to climate change uh they weren't here talking about the water bill even though you know i raised that but they're not they're not here talking about those things they're here talking about climate change and because it, it's, it's a large threat to us. It's the greatest threat we face, as I say. So um, I will just, I will read the, um, the last few whereas clauses here. Uh, whereas the municipality appears to be falling behind on actions identified in the climate change master plan and energy evolution to achieve council's greenhouse gas emission reduction targets. And whereas energy evolution outlines that the city needs to make the most significant financial investments over the next nine years, to realize long-term savings in greenhouse gas reductions. And whereas energy efficiencies and return on investment realized should be reinvested into the energy and emission reduction investments. And whereas the Corporate Energy Management Office saved 4.655 million in 2020, uh, therefore be it resolved that council directs staff to allocate 1 million in one-time funding through the annual capital close review. Uh, should the CFO and treasurer determine there are sufficient uh, funds to fund the climate change master plan to catalyze emission reductions, support ongoing climate ad adaptation work, and leverage federal funding. And two, I think this is the most important part of this motion, direct staff to report back by Q2 2022 with recommendations on the establishment of an energy and emissions fund, including one, the purpose and scope of the fund, two, the source of funds, 
Three, what the funds can be used for. Uh, four, how projects are selected to ensure that the funds advance the city's climate objectives specifically and target further savings for the municipality. Five, evaluation, monitoring, and reporting. And six, reporting schedule, frequency, and scope. Um, three, direct staff to assess direct energy savings beginning with the 2015 Conservation Demand Management Plan that results in tangible savings to the budget as a potential source of funds to seed an energy and emissions fund by Q1 2022 and four direct staff uh, to explore the development of a new community focused climate change financial plan to ramp up to stable funding from senior levels of government in line with energy evolution. So Chair, I'll just very briefly say that um, <clears throat> we as a city need to move on, on this. We are, um, have, I, we've done great work this term, really great work. We have ramped up with a fantastic plan that we've got We've started to, to fund some initiatives. We have a great staff team in place. You're seeing other line departments starting to move on transit. Um, of course, the, uh, the LRT investments, but the, uh, the uh, electrification of our transit system. We're seeing other departments move on this and understand that they can't just be business as usual. However, that being said, we have no steady funding uh, beyond what you have um, uh, allocated in the original portion of this term around the hydro auto dividends. And that was a wise move to do that initially to get some funding into this as a priority. But beyond that, we don't have stable funding. Uh, and we don't have something that's going to sustain that staff over time that needs to do this heavy legwork in the next nine years, as we say. Um, beyond that, too, we're making great investments in energy reducing emissions. Our beam team uh, reducing emissions, we're reducing our costs. Beam team is doing this, the LED cha changeover. These are things that actually save us money over time. And as we get to more building retrofits, this is what uh, will be required. So the motion does two things. The first is it, it establishes a million dollars for projects staff have outlined that we could do right away. Um, and those, uh, those projects are significant. Um, they um, speak to um, uh, several things around building retrofits. So for example, I'll just go through a few examples, Chair. Uh, one is around residential and commercial buildings um, and our uh, municipal building programs to uh, hire staff to support the residential, commercial, municipal retrofit campaigns associated with climate change master plan uh, it, to ensure that more private action takes place. One of the main emissions in our city is, is private emissions from individual homeowners and homes um, and energy evolution projects. And so we're also looking at climate resiliency strategies to so support a climate resiliency strategy and action plan development and early actions that come out of the climate vulnerability and risk assessment, uh, the evaluation of climate services provided by trees to support asset management plans and urban forest management plan, actions to mitigate extreme heat and further flood uh, risk assessment and response plans, contributes to that resiliency strategy we talked about, uh, having the potential of a solar, a solar uh, potential map, so a sunroof map for all of Ottawa. Um, you know, we've talked about the Greener Homes Grant and uh, builder, Building uh, Better Homes Ottawa, which uh, support residential solar, um, a community improvement uh, plan, um, you know, support to develop a community improvement plan that could support commercial retrofit, potentially high performance development standards. So these are these are the things there's there's others there as well. Funds to take advantage of the GHG reduction as opportunities uh, occur in different neighborhoods, applying for funds to other orders of government. These are all things that are that are needed. Um, the Bayview District Energy Study, the Biogas Feasibility Study, High Performance Windows, all things that can come from that $1 million I'm talking about in that first portion of the motion. The second portion of the motion would be to, re to establish a essentially an energy and emission fund, which would be a revolving fund, to so just see the funds put back into that fund as we're making savings uh, from other areas within the city uh, that we've, that we've um, deemed necessary. And so, that would sustain us over time. We would have the buildup that we need that is called for under the Climate Change Master Plan uh, to at least start that funding. And, and I'll just say this motion is not enough. We, there's so much more we need to do that all orders of government in the world needs to do on this issue. But it's, it's a start. It's a start to getting some stable funding over time that involves our finance staff with our climate change staff um, that can establish some, some stability for us uh, in the municipality. So, Chair, I'll leave it there. Sorry for the long-winded introduction, but this is a really important topic and uh, one we need to get right in the next little while. Thanks. Yeah, understood. I mean, it, the, it's it's great to develop the climate change master plan. It's great to develop energy evolution, but 
we need to implement it. Um, question just before I get to Councillor Brockington, just to Wendy Stephenson, the the first part of the motion speaks to um, funding this out of capital closures. So you will look at the capital closures in early 2022 uh, with the intent to find the million dollars to fund this motion. Is that correct? That's correct. Do you find that's the most feasible way to fund this motion? It is, yes. That's our recommended way to fund this. Okay. Okay, I just wanted to confirm that. Um, we'll go now to Councillor Brockington. Thanks, Chair, and thank you, uh, Councillor Menard, for this motion that um, certainly support the sentiments and just want to to get into it a bit more. If staff could comment on parts two to four, that would be appreciated. So, Chair, if you beg your indulgence, I'll make sure I'm working with the most recent version of the that and one of clerks can resend me the latest version. So I want to make sure I'm working the right one. We will do that right now, Mr. Chair. I wonder if I beat staff because I just sent it to you too. You did indeed beat us, Mr. Chair. <laughs> Still winning after all these years. Fortunately, it's not in my inbox yet. But Ugh. Actually, here we are. Excuse Ugh. me. It's Nepean. You know, we're all trying to send it from outside Nepean in Nepean, and Nepean's just failing. Nepean, Nepean, a wonderful grace, a wonderful place to be in, unless you need internet service, right? Am I right? Oh, geez. In all fairness, Chair, I'm at City Hall today. So. Oh. Oof, that backfired. Councillor Brockington could have passed it to me, Bob, by hand. I apologize. So, Councillor, if, if I can ask your indulgence to repeat your question now that I have it. Staff's position on points two to four. Chair, certainly we appreciate the, you know, it, the budget was prepared in a following the the guidelines council had set for the budget, and it's a very difficult year, as as the treasurer has indicated. So, you, the budget we put forward was the best of our resources. If additional resources do become to uh, come to us through this motion, the work in the budget motion in the mo motion by Councillor Menard is doable. Our staff did look that over last night, and it is it is work we can complete. The um, part two is basically the GHG mission budget fund. Talk to me how that would work. I just want to make sure we're um, thinking about the same direction here. So, Chair, I don't, I don't want to overstep uh, the councillor who moved the motion. So if I get this wrong, Councillor Menard, perhaps he can correct me the intent. The idea is that we were looking for a stable source of funding to primarily go into capital projects to really pay for projects that could demonstrably show that we are reducing our, our emissions from the city's uh, operations and facilities. And that uh, that's a way of ensuring that as savings happen, they get reinvested back into the fund. So it becomes a, a fund that refills from savings in the future. And I think that's the intent at a high level of what the 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 fund is described to do um, the it needs to be seated to get it going and that's the intent of the of the uh, councillor's motion so I, if if I have not stated that correctly perhaps Councillor Menard can correct me you've stated that correctly there's more detail there um, but but I if Councillor I'm happy to go into more detail but that's been stated correctly and are staff supportive of of clauses one through four in this motion. Staff are, are prepared to provide funding is made available. Staff are prepared to undertake the work as directed by council in this motion. Okay, I'm, I'm going to support this, but Mr. Willis, I'm going to put you on the spot and ask a question that I think everyone wants an answer to. And that is, why are we not, as a corporation, more aggressive in our investments in our GHG strategy? I'm, I'm very supportive of Councillor Menard's motion. I'm glad he brought it forward. But we all understand that the time to invest and be aggressive with our initiatives is now. 
that there is significant financial and environmental payoff over time, why do we have to beg, borrow, and steal for every penny to invest? Why are we not making this? Because we've declared an emergency and yet our budget doesn't reflect that emergency in, in our investments and contributions we're making. So could you please comment on that? So Chair, the, the discussion's all been about budget, but it hasn't been about work. So we reported to committee very recently an update on the climate change master plan, and we reported on our progress in eight priority areas, and we showed how every single operating department in the city is using a climate lens and finding savings on climate, uh, on GHG emissions through avoidance redesign that doesn't necessarily take place through a specific line item on the budget. And appreciate the point the delegations are, look, are making. They're looking for an easy path to figure out in the budget how the savings are happening. But we're looking at the, the buses. We are looking at, at Trail Road. We are looking at, at all kinds of different areas. Um, we talked about uh, the replacement of the Zamboni infrastructure and in rinks. Right? It's, it's happening across the entire organization. And it's coming through normal operating budgets as opposed to necessarily separated out, segregated out GHG budgets. We take the, the money council gives us every single year and reinvest it as council directs in accordance with the envelopes and the long range financial plan. We don't have sources of revenue that senior governments have, such as uh, progressive income taxes, consumption taxes, such as GST, G, uh, GST or HST or, or carbon pricing taxes. We don't have that. It all, all of our investment has to come off the property tax through tax supported. They're not, you can't apply user fees in many instances. There's a little bit in waste we can apply. So it really comes down to the decisions council makes of how you set your tax targets and how we apply that. So with respect, councillor, it's uh, staff are finding every opportunity to take what we have been given and allocated to us through the budget directions report. And we're finding every opportunity to deploy that for GHG reductions that we can. Thank you for that. And um... I don't want anyone to be misled in me thinking that staff aren't doing work. Uh, I think I've commented throughout my appreciation uh, for the various initiatives, but if council made $2 million available or five or 10, we would probably be able to identify initiatives that we're not currently invested in that we could direct those monies to. And I think we're all on the same page that, uh, like I said earlier, the time to act is, is yesterday. And so I'm, I'm looking for as many initiatives to be funded as possible. And like I said, I appreciate this motion. And I think it reflects the sentiments from the vast majority of people where they'd like to see the city of Ottawa go. So that's why I will be supporting it. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Councillor Brockington. Councillor McKinney. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm just looking back at uh, the 2021 report on um, <clears throat> the uh, 2020 corporate energy uh, report came out in 2021. And I note that the uh, energy savings um, amounted to over $7 million. And I understand that one of those was, you know, one time uh, year over year savings of about $3 million uh, because of a uh, number of our facilities were. were um, were closed for much of the year. Um, but I just wonder why when we have a, a report that, that outlines, you know, what we're saving, our corporate energy report, why, you know, I, and I obviously, I want to see 1 million going into the revolving fund, but why is that number not being contemplated? Um, I'm not necessarily asking the mover of the motion. I think that he would agree. Uh, but why do, is that number not contemplated uh, in investments in um, in our you know our energy evolution um, investments? Again, it just goes back to the savings, and it's where does that money go? Like what 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 did we do with it? What are we doing with it? And even if it's one time, maybe I'll just throw this out too. I don't, because I, I won't ask a follow-up then on this one, but even if it's one time, did we direct that into, um, our, you know, our, any of our climate action um, plans? 
So Chair, I'll start and Isabel, I see, can probably add to this. Um, certainly, I can't talk to the origins of the funding savings. They usually go back to the program area that would have been associated with it to, to offset other saving, other expenditures in those areas. Um, this has been an extraordinary two years of financial difficulty for the city with the pandemic. So we have not had the luxury of being as creative as we might be in other years. And I do believe that the, that the, the entire senior leadership team worked steadfastly hard under the direction of the treasurer to bring this budget in accordance with council's guidelines. Uh, there are a lot of pressures across the entire organization. And in this particular year, we did not have the flexibility to be that creative. So Isabel, I don't know if you wanna add that. That. Yeah, and I just wanted to, uh, Chair, add to the, in, in the motion, it speaks to assessing those savings and uh, looking at which ones are tangible. And a lot of those savings were cost avoidance and may not necessarily translate into budget savings. And so that's why we have to study it. Uh, happy to do it. Look at those savings and which ones are actually, we can be culled. Uh, and, and redirected, um, not, and we, we need to really assess all of those savings to understand which are cost avoidance and which are true bottom line savings. Okay, okay. I, I, and I understand that. Um, I just wanna make sure that as, as staff is doing that work and that as we're trying to understand that, that we're not filling gaps uh, filling pressures with savings that have come from some of the, the programs and the efforts that we've made. It's, it's not the way to, to do a global budget. You know, if, if there's a, if we're saving, that, that money has got to be rolled back into uh, our, our energy evolution programs. It, it can't be, it can't be plugged into keeping, um, you know, a, a cap, if you will. Uh, and, and, you know, uh, and, and I think it mostly goes to, you know, uh, subsidizing growth, which we don't do with a 2% budget, right? We, we just can't. It, it's impossible. We haven't done that in many years. Um, so I think that what we're doing here is we're, we're subsidizing growth, uh, which should be, you know, uh, paying for itself, or it should be, um, funded through um, uh, through taxes, through you know our property tax base, and 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 our and our climate action plans should not be funding, uh, and not not be funding growth, and it should not be you know keep keep funding our our budget pressures, our cola, and everything else as we keep um, you know what is essentially um, a non attainable. Uh, tax cap of 2% uh, in a city that's growing and that is seeing uh, inflation that is much greater than what we're budgeting for here. So um, I look forward to that conversation and I will have, um, I will discuss it with the, the mover of the motion as we move towards uh, council as well. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. Any other questions for staff or on Councillor Menard's motion at all? Seeing none. Uh, we can move to the item. So we'll first vote on the, the motion for Councillor Menard. Actually, does it fit somewhere? If we go through the roadmap, does it fit anywhere in there? Or should we just do it at the start? Or does anyone actually care if we go through the roadmap and do you want to just approve all at once? approve okay all right so don't worry about caitlin don't worry about your the question i asked you we'll just so on uh, Councilor menard's motion carried carried I said, what i just sent mr Chair. oh sorry i was like i heard a word i wasn't that sent thank you um i'm just gonna go back to Yeah, sorry, just bear with me a sec here. Yeah, so the motion's in front of us then. I do have to read the road motion, but we won't I won't go one by one. So uh, move 
you know, technically by council but I'll just read them just for sake of brevity. Um, on the tax supported budget, be it resolved that staying committee on environmental protection, water and waste management recommend that council sitting as committee of the whole approve the standing committee on environmental protection, water and waste management, 2022 tax supported draft operating budget and capital budget as follows. One, infrastructure services. Two, resiliency and natural systems pol policy operating resource requirement. Three, solid waste services. Four, forest services. And five, standing committee on environmental protection, water and waste management, tax support capital budgets on page, pages 14 to 15, individual projects listed on pages 30 to 31, page 33, and pages 35 to 44. So on the tax supported budget. Carry. 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 Okay. And on to uh, uh, yeah. Mr. Chair, sorry, uh, I was just on a call. So I, I the, the last uh, vote there, and then yeah. you said you, it, I thought well? you were still coming back to the vote. Uh, I'd like to dissent along with Councilor DeRue's, please. No worries. So noted. So on that, uh, the rate supported budget now, be it resolved that the Standing Committee on Environment Protection, Water and Waste Management recommend the Council, seeing as Committee of the Whole, approve the Standing Committee on Environment Protection, Water and Waste Management 2022 rate supported draft operating capital budget as follows. One, drinking water services, two, wastewater services, three, stormwater services, four, the Standing Committee on Environment Protection, Water and Waste Management rate supported capital budget on pages 18 and 22, individual project list pages 36 to 62, 64 to 69, 71 to 93, and 95 to 114. Is that carried? Carried. 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 All right, thank you. I note uh, just uh, earlier, Councillor Cloutier was thanking staff, knowing that they keep our water safe. It's a good thing they do, otherwise we'd all go to jail. You know, the whole Clean Water Act thing. So thank you to staff for keeping us all prison free. So moving on with the agenda, Oh, we have item two. As, as amended. Carried as amended. Yes. Thank you, Christopher. Thank you. Item two, which is the one that everyone's been waiting for. The update on the local improvement policy and ditch alteration policy. Since 2003, I haven't really been able to fill in your ditch with a culvert. Since 2003, since 2010, I've been trying to find a way to fix that. And today, 11 years later, we get an update on it. Charmaine? Well, thank you, Chair, for that. And uh, yes, it's been quite a while. And unfortunately for the ditch uh, infill, that's going to have to wait to uh, Q2 of 2022. But, I know, but uh, it's an update. It's it an update. is an update, that's, so it is exciting. Something. Yes, it is something. Thank you, Chair. Uh, before we get started, I just wanted to take a moment to acknowledge the, the work and the time that's been put into the Local Improvement and Ditch Infill Internal Working Group. Uh, this was an interdepartment effort with several departments, EPS, uh, Public Works, Environmental Services, Financial Services, and Planning, Infrastructure, and Economic Development Department. Uh, so thank you to all the members. Today, we are focusing on the updates on the local improvement policy. We will be, as I mentioned, bringing the ditch alteration policy with supporting enforcement activities in Q2 2022. I would like to now turn it over to, May, uh, to Megan, who will review the updates in the local improvement policy. Over to you, Megan. Thank you, Charmaine. Um, I just want to start first. Uh, oh, sorry. Next slide, please. Um, so I first want to start by summarizing what a local improvement is. Um, a local improvement is a capital infrastructure project delivered by a municipality. It is typically initiated by a property owner or a group of property owners and benefits a select group of property owners in a defined area, usually within an existing or established neighborhood. The cost of local improvement is recovered by the city from all benefiting property owners. Typical examples of local improvement project inquiries we receive in the city of Ottawa include sewers, water mains, noise barriers, engineered drainage systems, including roadside ditches, and roads. This process is not unique to Ottawa. The city is authorized to undertake local improvements by Ontario Regulation 586, which is under the Municipal Act. This regulation is very prescriptive and spells out the major process milestones and the required documentation for associated cost recovery 
all of which are included in the local improvement uh, update, uh, updated policy in front of you today. Next slide, please. So the updated local improvement policy was undertaken in three phases. The process began in 2019 with the review of existing local improvement policy and documentation of existing business practices. This was followed by the development of recommendations by the multidisciplinary working group in early 2021. Finally, this process culminated with the revised local improvement policy being presented today. This updated policy includes two changes. First, a separation of the policy from the detailed implementation procedures. And second, an increase of the success threshold for the survey of interest from a simple majority to a two thirds majority or 67% of the affected property owners. Just a reminder, the survey of interest is circulated early in the process and gauges the support of affected property owners for the local improvement prior to investing further funds in subsequent steps of the process. The first change provides a policy which now speaks to all type of local improvement projects and has been updated to align with current legislative requirements. Separation of the detailed implementation procedures from the policy keeps the policy concise while providing detailed procedures for staff to ensure consistency and business continuity. Updates to the technical appendices can be done as required without, over, without altering the overarching policy principles. The second change, the increase of the survey of interest threshold to two thirds is consistent with the success threshold of the local improvement petition, a step occurring later in the local improvement process and is set out by regulation 586 and is also similar to the required threshold for a number of other city processes. Should council and committee choose to adopt this updated policy, the revised procedures would be targeted for implementation in Q1 of next year. Next slide, please. Finally, I wanted to provide an update on our progress with respect to the ditch alteration policy. As noted in the previous slide, alteration of an engineered drainage system, including roadside ditches, can be undertaken by a local improvement process. To start, a review was undertaken of the existing ditch alteration policy and documentation of current business practices by the working group was completed in October of this year. We are currently in phase two. A consultant has been retained to conduct an objective third-party review of the impacts of ditch alterations, a policy consistency review, and a business process review. The results of their work will be provided through three technical memos and will support the updating of the ditch alteration policy along with recommended enforcement activities. This report is targeted for committee and council in Q2 of 2022. Um, recommendations will be provided to assist the transition from current practice and policies to the recommended future process. Thank you very much. That concludes my presentation. Sorry, that was just off screen for a second. Just over there in that part of the office. Anyways, uh, Councillor Brockington, question. Thank you, Chair. Thank you to staff for this um, presentation today and update to the committee. Um, surprises a number of people that three out of River Ward six major neighborhoods have ditches and culverts uh, in part of their community. It's not widespread but certainly in neighborhoods that are older, uh, this uh, infrastructure is in place. And so there, there are pockets of interest with ditches and culverts. Um, I have had um, some recent inquiries within the last 24 hours about this report. And um, I note in the staff report that public consultation to this point was not um, undertaken. So I, I want to wrap my head around going forward, how will the public be engaged um, with the remaining steps before this comes back before the committee? Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, we will be developing a consultation of uh, citywide. And also if a specific wards want to have specific consultation, we'll be doing that as well. Uh, this is the first 
piece with the local improvement was more of a housekeeping, setting the stage for us with the, the ditch and fill. So there's more to come uh, and there will be some consultation with the different pieces as we get the information going forward. And the policy that's before us today was also not uh, sort of vetted with the public. Can you again tell us what is, this is a revised policy, is that correct? It's not a new policy, if I heard correctly in the presentation? Yeah. Megan? Yeah, so this is an updated policy. There was a previously existing policy. Um, and again, as Charmaine said, it's very much um, housekeeping. The city only has a certain amount of latitude because of the prescriptive regulatory requirements within the process. Um, where our policy, where the city has um, jurisdiction to change is in the survey of interest at the beginning, which allows staff resources to be allocated and city funds to be allocated where there is a genuine interest of a large number of benefiting property owners within the area. Um, so there isn't a lot of latitude in, in how uh, we approach this because of the regulatory requirements we're required to follow. Okay, so finally, will staff be proactively reaching out to members of council to gauge who's interested in that type of outreach in their communities? Or is the onus on us to reach out to you and say, hey, we wanna organize something in a community? What's the best way going forward? Um, uh, thank you, Chair. Um, we will be doing a memo to council to ask uh, the, each councillor who would like to have that uh, more in-depth uh, consultation, but we'll, we will be doing a general one as well. Fair enough, thank you, appreciate that, thank you. Thank you. Thanks. So just to provide some more background, I know I kind of joked about the start, but uh, prior to amalgamation, there are municipalities that allowed this, municipalities that didn't allow this. Um, ditch infills were very, quite common in Rideau Township and in Nepean, uh, but elsewhere they weren't. And uh, out of ease, uh, they just banned them all after amalgamation. They just took the easiest one, the easiest approach, which was the municipalities that just didn't allow them. So where they were allowed, uh, they stopped being allowed. And in Rideau Township, there was a process where You'd have three inspections. Like staff would actually be involved in the in the infill. You'd apply for it. Uh, you'd pay for it, but staff would actually be involved in how it was how it was done. Make sure that it has the proper swale, the catch basin to catch the, the water from the runoff from the road, which is the whole point of the ditch in the first place. But we have communities like in Munster where we have courts that have six foot ditches. They've got the, the front yard depth is is almost the same as the as the the depth of the ditch, and and there's no possible way for some of some of our older. Uh, residents to maintain this ditch yet as a part of the property standards bylaw they have to maintain their their ditch so there's a there's a lot of challenge that they have and and yet one of them hasn't been you know being able to to put a culvert in properly do it uh, in fact we've had situations where people have done it neighbors have complained george knows about this and then and then the city has to come in and and tear out the work and it could be five thousand dollars worth of work the city has to go out and and tear out because it's not permitted even though the work they might have done is something that doesn't actually harm anything. So it's a bit of a, a weird situation that we found ourselves in that was a post amalgamation issue that never really got addressed. Uh, and that's where I've just been trying to find ways to address it for years. And so far, we're getting to a, to a point where we'll be able to have something there in place, hopefully that we can, can have that option. Uh, it seems minor in the grand scheme of things, but to the individuals um, who it impacts, it's, it's not. Uh, so thank you uh, to staff for, for working on this and thank you for, Presenting it, I know, like I said, it seems minor, but I wanted to hear about it. So uh, anyways, on that, uh, I think it's just a received item, received the presentation. I just bring my agenda back up. I have like three screens and I don't have any open. Uh, so that the Standing Committee on Environmental Protection, Water and Waste Management recommend that council, one, approve the local improvement policy and two, receive the update on the ditch alteration policy. Is item carried? Carried. 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 Thank you. So we move toward the end of the meeting. In camera items, there are none. Notices of motion. Councillor King? Yes, I did uh, have a notice of motion, Chair. Um, it uh, regards um, uh, the fact uh, that uh, there are many Im negative impacts to uh, gas powered uh, leaf blowers 
And I understand that counselors also hear a similar feedback from residents in their own communities. Uh, to quickly highlight some of these negative impacts, it's important to know that, our, that most uh, gas-powered leaf blowers operate on a two-stroke engine or the marginally better four-stroke engine. And other maintenance equipment also makes use of this engine, which uh, while light and portable is also so fuel inefficient, it has been found to emit more than 20 times the toxic and, and, and uh, cancer causing exhaust than a vehicle. Uh, now consider how frequently the city uses leaf blowers in public parks uh, near schools or to maintain other public spaces. Uh, this is definitely a challenge. And beyond uh, the air pollution concerns, these engines operate at a decibel level and frequency that the World Health Organization has determined uh, negatively impacts our health. Uh, a typical two-stroke leaf blower operates well above the decibel level of our bylaw, uh, which our bylaw stipulates for equipment such as air conditioners, exhaust systems, or pool filtration pumps. Although we restrict the hours during which they can be used, we do not specifically um, um, uh, really address an, ac an acceptable decibel level uh, for leaf blowers. While I believe a permanent solution will necessitate a change to our bylaws governing the use of this equipment, it is important to start in our own backyard. The National Capital uh, Commission is accelerating their efforts to eliminate the use of gas-powered lawn equipment from all of their maintenance contracts, and the city has many reciprocal maintenance agreements with the NCC throughout Ottawa. It makes sense for us to step up our own efforts and transition away from this outdated harmful technology as quickly as possible. So the intent of the uh, motion that I'm introducing uh, today, giving notice of motion is to eliminate city owned gas powered lawn and yard equipment as quickly as possible and to align our efforts uh, with the National Capital Commission uh, to provide a cohesive, healthier experience uh, for our residents. Uh, my office and myself, we did uh, work uh, very extensively with staff and we thank staff for their engagement and their contribution to the final draft of this motion, um, as there were a lot of conversations. And I will just uh, read uh, the uh, therefore be it resolved uh, uh, resolutions uh, that the public works and environmental services department commit to phasing out the use of and preventing the purchase of gas-powered lawn and yard equipment when said equipment requires replacement and a suitable electric alternative is available that meets operational needs within both city-owned and contracted services and be it further resolved that phasing out activities begin as quickly as possible starting with summer operations planning in Q1 2020 and report back to the Standing Committee on Environmental Protection, Water and Waste Management as part of a departmental green equipment plan in Q4, 2022. Thank you. And speaking with Councillor King on this previously, they, I was doing some, some research into it and found out that, that uh, California has, has banned these actually statewide and companies there have just stopped selling them all together anyway. So it actually worked out quite well. So it was almost like it was industry driven. Uh, to a degree, but one of the one of the studies they had, they had a report on it, and equated that you could drive a 2016 Toyota Camry from Los Angeles to Denver and produce the same amount of emissions as running a gas powered leaf blower for one hour. I find that almost unreal. Yeah. Um, so thanks, uh, Councillor King. So that'll be at our next Environment Committee meeting, which won't actually be till February, but plenty of time to consider it. Uh, I don't think any other notice of motions we have. Uh, Councillor Cloutier does have an inquiry though. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, yes, indeed. Um, further to the discussions we have today on invasive species and removals in public spaces, my inquiry, and I, I will send it along to, uh, to Chris and he might have it already. <clears throat> what programs are currently in place to mitigate invasive species in Ottawa? What volunteer programs, if any, are in place or being explored to mitigate invasive species in public green spaces? What are the costs or resources associated with establishing a city program to allow for volunteer efforts to remove and mitigate invasive species in public green spaces, particularly with regard to work location, 
established and monitored training that could be provided to leaders, volunteers being educated on identifying species and proper methods to remove them, debris being removed from the site or disposed of properly, staff follow up upon completion to ensure native species are encouraged to thrive in the area. The final part is what departments need to be consulted in developing this initiative and what strategies can be implemented to reduce the barriers or silo situations that might be encountered. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Cloutier. Any other inquiries? Seeing none. Other business? None. And adjournment. Adjourned. Adjourned. Thank you. So our next meeting in the in the thing it says to be determined that's because we haven't uh, nailed down the meeting dates for for 2022 but uh in all likelihood it's going to be the third tuesday in february all right thank you all oh we have a media availability who ever wants to listen to me talk some more after this meeting in 15 minutes so we'll see you all then